Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everybody. My name's Sandy. I'm an alcoholic. How y'all doing? We flipped a coin last night, and I'm going to start, and then we're going to go back and forth, and um, we decided to take 10 or 15 minutes each and briefly describe our stories and how we got here, and then talk a little bit about um, the uh, hand of God in the um, origins of AA, just very briefly, maybe each of our favorite stories that illustrates that. Um, but I had um, some kind of miscommunication. I had all this stuff ready on the tenth tradition, and um, <laughs> so we're going to shift over to there is a solution, <laughs> so that when you buy the CDs, you won't have the title on there, and then you listen, and it's all about the tenth tradition, and that would. Maybe get somebody drunk. (laughs) Anyway, very briefly, um, I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut in the 30s. I have one sister. She has uh, 28 years in AA now. And um, we're both brought up in the Catholic Church, sitting almost in the same pew, She heard the most friendly things in the world, still loves that church, thought it was the nicest, kindest, the warm-hearted nuns. And I sat next to her and got terrified out of my skin. And um, at age eight, I was sitting on the front row. I studied that catechism, and I had my ear yanked, and, uh, you know, that's what was going to happen to me, and I had a personal revelation. I was looking at the crucifix. It's about 20 feet high, wooden cross. You couldn't miss it. It was hanging right there. (laughs) And it was like I kept staring at it and staring at it, and it was almost like a light or a message came, and it said, little boy, do you see this? And I went, yes. Well, this is what God did to his only son that he loved. (laughs) guess what he's going to do to you and I actually felt faint I mean I lost consciousness with the shock of this new truth and um, I, I just you know the idea of God I just never wanted to die because I knew when you died You're in for it. (laughs) So it was hard for me to find any comfort um, with the concept of a higher power. And um, I needed that desperately because I was so uncomfortable in my own skin. I knew there was something missing in my life. I knew that I wasn't the same as other people. I never fit in anywhere. It was extremely awkward to do anything. I find it hard to meet people. And yet I was... um, You know, I'd be voted the best natured. I was funny and all that. So if you saw this outside, you said, look at that guy. Look at that guy. And inside, I'm just about to have a nervous breakdown. And um, I went to a little school. I was telling um, Don on the way over here, I went to a little tiny prep school in New Haven called Hopkins. (laughs) And uh, it was founded in 1660. And just a little tiny day school, but it had been there for a long, long time. And I, it was a wonderful little school, and it was a pipeline right into the Ivy League. And so I went right down to Yale and New Haven. And when I got there, I was overpowered by all these people that came from all over the country, and they're all wealthy, and they all were just so much superior to me uh, that I knew I didn't belong there. And I had this feeling during freshman year that the dean was going to call all thousand freshmen out onto the old campus and was going to say, gentlemen, we have discovered we have an imposter in our midst. <laughs> He's right back there, and they were going to have guys come and get me out of there. So that was the comfort level that I had 
and we were supp- we, I went to the thing, I, and my roommates are going, you're in college, you ought to be drinking, and drinking was a sin, and drinking, I don't know, there was something about it that I was trying to stay away from. Um, but they kept telling me, it'll make you feel wonderful, make you feel wonderful. And I um, was at this social event where you're supposed to go around and meet all these other guys, you know, those type of things, mix and meet or whatever it is. It's just like going into combat as far as I'm concerned. That is <laughs> terrifying. And I tried. I would try, and I couldn't pull it off. And that night I went over and walked up to a group, and they all were looking at me, and you could just see it. I mean, people talk with their eyes. You can see it there. And they were going, we don't want to know you. We have enough friends. Stay the hell away from our little group. And it would just, uh, I'd just be take my breath away. So I'd try to go to another group, and they gave me the same signal. It was so powerful. And so I never saw, couldn't get my hand out to actually say hello to anyone. And there was a bar there, and I decided, God, it'd feel good. That would be nice. And maybe I'll have a drink, and maybe it could feel good. And I had a drink, and nothing happened. I had another drink, and nothing happened. And halfway through the, through the third drink, I decided to leave. I said, I don't feel good. I just, it's just astounding with the overrated stuff they're talking about. And, you know, what is this? And I turned as if to leave. And I looked back at these guys, and it was as if they were gone, and there were now 40 of the friendliest eyes I have ever seen. Everybody in that room wanted to know me. They were begging me to come join them. And I just went, my God, I can't believe this. And I I just had a whole new view of the world. It was no longer a dangerous place. It was a wonderful place. And people in it were marvelous. They all were smiling and and I just had a spring in my step, and I suddenly had a realization that they're going to be lucky to know me. <laughs> and it was sort of a mutual admiration going on right there. And I just, uh, my fears were removed so I could be creative. I could think of something to say. It wasn't stifled anymore. And I just thought to myself, you should have started drinking in grammar school. <laughs> this is remarkable how it takes you to a new place to live. I just was in a world that I thought was just one. I just couldn't believe it. It was just the the greatest. And I'd only been drinking 10 minutes. (laughs) I now had the new favorite thing, and there wasn't even a close second. And, of course, that night, if a little bit is good, then 25 drinks would be better. And, of course, I got sick and room spinning and vomiting and dry heaving and waking up on the cold tile in the bathroom and right near the toilet so you could dry heave and lie down and dry heave and lie down and my head hurt and my whole body ached and my hair hurt. You remember when just everything was dying and I sat on my bed just thinking about this and the thought came in, well, are you going to drink again tonight? And I went, oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I said, this pain and throwing up and vomiting and absolute anguish is a small price to pay for what I had last night. So I made my deal right there, that no matter what it took, it was worth it. So alcohol did something for me that it doesn't do for average drinkers. You wouldn't hear average drinkers talking like this, that they would give up, you know. And so if the devil had come along and said, all right, all right, before you go into this, I want to just make sure you understand the deal that you're signing up for. Now, are you willing to give up your high grades? Yep, 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 I'd be willing to give that. How about athletics? You like that? No, I'd be willing to give up athletics if I can keep this new power that I found. Well, how about getting your teeth knocked out? How about broken bones, getting arrested, almost flunking out? Your family will almost disown you. Yep, that'll be all right. Yeah, I think I can handle that. I can handle that. With this new power, I think I could handle just about anything as long as I have access to this. So I, that, Now, see, I thought I was a social drinker. I thought everybody had this remarkable transformation and awakening and, and all of that. And so, my, you know, the rest of the story is uh, sort of incidental. In other words, Once you're an alcoholic, that's the main event. And then there's these side plots like getting married and joining the Marine Corps and (laughs) becoming a fighter pilot like Creighton over there. And these things are like a hobby or some other thing (laughs) that you do in addition 
to maintaining this relationship with alcohol. And so, but I just thought I was a, having fun, you know, going about my way. And after um, about ten and a half years of flying in the Marine Corps, the end came. The disease just came and shut me down. I ended up flying where I didn't want to be in the plane. I didn't trust the pilot thing. I, he was. He didn't know what he was doing. He was in bad shape and all these things. And um, I remember, um, no matter what your job is, if you're an alcoholic, you are encountering situations that aren't supposed to be encountered. You know what I'm talking about in your job? Like, um, I heard a doctor one time, he came out of a blackout in the middle of surgery and didn't know the procedure that he was doing, and he was trying to talk to the people around him. To, they would give him a clue as to what he was doing, and that type of situation was not covered in medical school. <laughs> and I was going through uh, withdrawals in the planes, and there was nothing in the um, F-8 you handbook about flying the Crusader during withdrawals, alcoholic withdrawals. So you have to make up your own solutions. That's my point, is that you are left creatively thinking your way out of things. And I remember going, what am I going to do? I'm going to pass out. I'm, I'm losing my vision. I'm sweating. And I'm flying this thing, and i got to finish this. And so I came up with flying the mission with one hand. It was a photo mission. And on the stick, and that controlled the cameras and everything, and then the other hand was on the ejection seat. And my theory was that if I passed out, I'd pull the curtain, and I would go out, the plane would crash, the chute would open automatically at 10,000 feet, and I would be safe. And I remember, in spite of feeling panicky, I felt smug. You know what I mean? It was almost like, well, they almost had the old fox. <laughs> but he got out of another one. And so you can see we're not doing too well. And, and So I went to the doctors, and they couldn't find out what was wrong, and they uh, diagnosed me after three months or three weeks of observation as childhood fear of flying, and I was retrained as an air traffic controller during my last year of drinking. And uh, during that time, I lost about 50 pounds, malnutrition, stopped hanging around people, just um, drank alone, drank vodka, tried to, uh, I put vodka in soup, and that was what I was trying to eat. That was, I couldn't eat food. I was very sick, very sick. And I came back to the States and uh, had a grand mal seizure, went into the hospital, and six days later, I had the DTs, and the room was, there were people, and the CIA was trying to break me, and it was just remarkable, all that. And evidently, I was screaming all over the place, and they got me and put me in a straitjacket and locked me up in the nut ward for six months. And so that was my crashing and burning. And while in there, an AA group talked their way in. They said, you know, you have some alcoholics in that mental Ward. Oh, I don't, we don't have alcoholics in the Navy and all that. <laughs> we think there's a few in there. Why don't you let us bring a meeting in? And so a corpsman had three of us fall in on our little bathrobes. We went down. I heard about it. It sounded great, but I didn't think it was exactly for me. And so when I was let out and they told me if I ever drank again, my career was over. And... Um, you know, I just had one drink here and one drink there, and now I'm smuggling booze back into the nut ward. <laughs> and uh, somehow I got out of there, was sent back. Um, no, I knew I was going to get caught. And on December 7th, 1964, which is my anniversary, I called AA from the Marine base at Quantico, and they sent another Marine captain over. He was the only other Marine member of AA. And he came to my house and took over. He was my sponsor. He's still my sponsor. I have the same sponsor for almost 40 years. And he just took me in and took control of my life. He just said, this is a 12-step call. I talk, you listen. <laughs> Boom. Get in the car. That was the basic message. <laughs> and I haven't had a drink since. And I was indoctrinated into this incredible program 
that we're going to talk about today that has been the most exciting thing. I thought flying those planes was exciting, but this is much more exciting. It's a much bigger deal. It is, it is absolutely, there's no comparison. And if you're new, we hope to impart to you today the tremendous excitement of spirituality. This is the major leagues. This, when we move into this level, we're going up at the epic level. This is why we're alive, is to have the opportunity to experience what's available here. Thanks. I'll turn it over to Bob. I'm Bob, the alcoholic. Hi, Bob. Sober for the grace of God in AA since December 10th, 1967. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you want to take this one? No, I got, okay, that's, that's all right. on. Uh, isn't Sandy wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he is. He is. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think he's dollar. better on tape than he is in person, but I, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, he has, he has been one of my heroes in AA. I think he is one of the most gifted communicators we have. Uh, many of you know my story. I started drinking when I was 13. I was, uh, when I entered high school, I was 4 foot 11, 95 pounds. He kind of told my Catholic, you know, experience. There was a lot of pain and guilt. I never escaped, but I, you know, experienced the pain and guilt. But this, doesn't he put into words the experiences that almost all of us have? I, I mean, so, you know, word pictures. You can just see it and experience it. And all of us had those. And, the, and the, what I find fascinating is a lot of those old ideas still bedevil us. Ideas we've made up about ourselves, about how good we are at certain things and how bad we are at certain things. You know, we're 60 years old and still some of those things crop up, you know, that we made up our minds about when we were in 8, 9, 10, and 11 years old. I, when I entered high school, I was 95 pounds, 4 foot 11, insecure, almost all mouth. I was, uh, I was the class clown. I was just had these constant eyes looking for what I thought you wanted, you know, trying to fit in, trying to be a member of the in-group. Um, had my experience with alcohol. It was much like Sandy's. It wasn't like a change. It was like a sex change operation. You know, I mean, it literally was a, you know, a transformation, which is interesting because I think that's what recovery does is give us a transformation. And I felt like I didn't wasn't part of the group. I felt like I owned it. You know, I mean, it, it literally allowed me to move around with a sense of ease and comfort that I've never had in my life. And uh, and when you find something that that's great, you just chase it. And I chased it, you know, pretty hard. And by the time I finished high school, I was in a lot of trouble for drinking. I had false ID cards, been arrested, car accidents, uh, went away to school, thought I'd get away from I thought the problem was I was underage. And, uh, you know, the police nor my parents thought that was a good idea that I drank. I went away. I drank my way to the University of Notre Dame, middle of my senior year. And you just, uh, you know, there's a lot of stories that went on. I, I was due to be commissioned as an officer. I had to get a medical release. The medical release I got was for alcoholism. I was diagnosed an alcoholic when I was 19. I thought that was nuts. I mean, I thought, you know, how can a 19-year-old be an alcoholic? Uh, kind of unusual, you'd run into a psychiatrist that knew enough about alcoholism that he was willing and able to diagnose a 19-year-old as an alcoholic, wanted me to go to either to treatment or, or AA. I was not prepared for that. And uh, I was just confused. I couldn't give up alcohol. It was the only thing that made sense to me. I think it kept me alive during that period. Suicide, for whatever reason, was a, a regular thought for me. And I don't know if it was just the kind of suicide where we feel sorry for ourselves or how serious that would have gotten, but alcohol relieved. You know, when the rest of the guys would go on semester break up to New York, up to New York for the city, I'd go buy three bottles, and I'd get a, you know, I'd get an overstuffed chair from the lounge, put it in my room, and I'd, you know, I'd read and drink for the weekend. That was my trip. And uh, when I walked out of Notre Dame, I came back. I finished school at St. Thomas University. When I finished school there, my father uh, said, Bob, you got to leave the house. I'm one of seven kids, great parents, great brothers and sisters. He said, we love you. We don't know what to do with you. He said, you're just a mess. You're, you know, you're a bad example for everybody else in the family. And uh, you got to go. So I, uh, you know, took a job at a liquor store. 
and uh, uh, have to use your gifts. And uh, <laughs> Vietnam's on. I'm kind of doing this part-time thing, trying to figure out what branch of the service I'm going to, you know, try to get into. And the third time, I they lost my physicals after I. I was accepted into officer candidate school. They lost my physical. The fourth time I took the physical, they failed me. You know, they said, take it again. So I took it again, and they failed me. And uh, I got a job as an executive trainee. All I wanted to do was grow up. It seemed like adults were okay. Kids had these awkward moments. All I wanted to do was get to be kind of like my father and his friends, and they'd make you vice president someplace, and you'd be okay. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know there was a process involved in that. I, I, thought, I thought you just kind of happened automatically. And I went to work at a local corporation, and I was a basket case. I had no idea what I was doing. I, you know, they put me behind a desk. You know, I didn't know what I was doing behind a desk. I am uh, can't stop drinking. Uh, now I'm the company drunk. You know, they used to use my room in Notre Dame for a study hall. You know, Rudy, you see that movie Rudy? He went to Notre Dame. I passed through. You know, I mean, he actually had the experience. When you're an alcoholic, you don't get to have a life. You know, what you give up is yourself in that process. And I, I gave up myself in that process. And now I'm at this company, and I'm just, uh, you know, I use up my sick leave in the first four months of work. I am uh, <laughs> falling asleep at my desk. I'm sleeping my hangovers off and broom closets and dark rooms. And, you know, I quit the job, uh, took a job as a salesman, thought it would give me more flexibility. And, I again, I can't shut down my drinking. I don't know what it, you know, I, I just can't get the rhythm, and I'm, can't, and I can't drink and work, which, you know, so therein lies the problem. And uh, I finally, just out of desperation, I, one of my buddies got married, and I uh, went on about a five-day drunk, and I woke up, not five-day, three-day drunk. I woke up th on Thursday, uh, and I didn't know if I had a job, a fiance, or a place to live, and uh, I called AA. That had been recommended to me, and I didn't think it was a good idea. But that day, I was, <laughs> I was out of ideas. And two men came and talked to me. And I had, uh, you know, maybe the most important day sometime in July 1967. And they came out and they talked to me about uh, their drinking problem and told me they found a solution, and hoped that that might have some interest to me. But for some reason, they found that talking to people like me helped them stay sober. And in their sharing of their lives with me they changed my life. Uh, it was a, it was, I had talked to all sorts of experts to try to help me, but I'd never talked to another person with a drinking problem. And these two guys, one was six years and one was six months, uh, altered me and dropped me in the first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I drank twice after that, once on a business trip uh, after 30 days and once on my honeymoon after th three months. Uh, but it was never the same. I mean, with the information they gave me and the experience I had in the meetings, um, you know, it wasn't the same. And I had my last drink December 10th on the last day of my honeymoon on the way back. Uh, and it's just been a trip uh, that is just unexplainable. I think the most profound thing for me when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I have the same sponsor since I walked in the front door of AA, Warren. I've had the same sponsor for almost 37 years. And... Uh, the, uh, I think the most profound thing for me is that they told me it was a disease that affected me physically, but also mentally and spiritually. I knew I had been sober a couple of times. I, I went back to my senior year. I was almost killed. I, wasn't, I was beaten up, robbed, rolled, pistol whipped, shot at, thrown out of the second story of a hotel, ended up in the psych ward uh, of a hospital, and they were going to not let me go back for my senior year at school. And I went back and I didn't drink. Not drinking was not an answer for me. It was it was horrible. It was as bad as anything I've ever experienced. And so when people would say, Bob, what's wrong with you is a drinking problem, I mean, it would seem obvious that stopping would be the resolution of a drinking problem. Stopping did not solve my issue. And I, and I said, there, there's something else wrong with me. I mean, it's deep, dark, dirty, unattractive. I got a built-in failure mechanism. I seem like I'm talented. I can inter I interview well. I just can't work. And uh, I wish they gave prizes for interviewing. I, uh, well, I interviewed well until I interviewed for the job at AA. But other than that, I, I did. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, when they told me that it was physical, but I remember my sponsor told me that the physical part was like 10% of the deal. I was, 
I can't tell you how shocked they were. I thought we'd spend a lot of time talking about how not to drink. He said, no, once we're in AA, we use the 12 steps to change. He said, we use the 12 steps to the recovery program to find a different way to live, to be different. If you don't find a different way to live, if you don't change, you're going to go back because you don't know how to live without drinking. So what they gave me the idea, and then I said after the meeting, we'd go to the meetings like at 7.30, the meeting started at 8, I'd go home about 11.30, and you'd listen to these guys talk to their sponsors, and they weren't, almost none of it was about drinking. It was about fights with their wife, problems at work, doing bills, doing amends, how to do it. You know, I mean, it was talking about how to live. It was a very, you know, different sort of thing, and I really got hope. You know, I really got a sense that there was a solution and uh, you can't describe the trip. I mean, you couldn't draw a straight line <coughs> from where I was, you know, to where <laughs> to where I am today. Uh, our meeting Friday was on, you know, hope you don't get what you deserve. You know, that's uh, one thing. <laughs> if any of you are out there praying for justice, I recommend you stop it. <laughs> uh, mercy is a better uh, <laughs> mercy is a better approach to. Uh, uh, to the thing. So it's just been a hell of a ride. It has been, it has been a solution. Uh, I found in sobriety what I was looking for in a bottle. Who would have thunk? Huh? Who would have thunk that I found everything I was looking for in a, Bible, in, in a bottle and more uh, in these rooms? So um, I'm going to be pleased to share these with Sandy and you this afternoon. And uh, Sandy's going to now talk to us a little bit about uh, our history and God's role in that. Now we will try to play off that. Thank you, Bob. Great job. Great job. Now, if you knew there's going to come a day in your AA uh, life when history will grab you, uh, in the beginning I wasn't remotely interested in it. And as time has gone by, it just becomes more and more fascinating. And I love our archivists and I'm so grateful for all the work they've done. But one of the things that I see in there that makes me just feel so wonderful is the hand of God. You just see that this thing did not just happen. I'll tell you something that did just happen without the hand of God. That was the Washingtonian Society, which was incredibly successful for a certain period of time, and then it just collapsed. And that thing got started by just six guys at a bar who uh, saw that their lives were coming apart. And they were pretty, you know, guys in their 20s, they're businessmen and uh, professionals. And they said, if we don't get a handle on this drinking, we're going to lose everything. And they said, yeah, you're right. And they drink to that and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> And they, what was big at this time in the 1840s were temperance movements and pledges and all this kind of stuff. So they said, we'll make up our own pledge. Maybe the six of us can keep each other sober. So let's get a pledge. Yeah, yeah, I'll get a pledge. I'll get a pledge. And they got this pledge, and it didn't have anything to do with God. It just had to do with saying in front of other people, I swear to never touch this evil stuff, and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, they found that the six of them, they would meet once a week and talk about how they didn't drink. And they said, this is great. We ought to go out and promote it. And so they had great promotions. And they tried to get people of high <clears throat> stature to join so that other people would join. And it became an incredibly exciting event. And at the end of the first year, they had something like 6,000 people in a parade in Baltimore, Maryland, celebrating this wonderful thing that they had discovered. And they, had, they allowed no politics, no religion, no nothing. You just don't drink. You say this pledge, and then you share um, about how you're doing without this de evil alcohol. And uh, within um, a relatively few years, six or seven years, they had uh, gone to other cities, and this thing had, was uh, up the estimates are between three and 400,000 members, which is a bigger percentage of the population than AA is today. That's how big it was. And it disappeared like that. <clears throat> they took positions on outside issues. 
started dividing amongst themselves and there was no spiritual basis, it was almost like a pyramid club. And you just keep it, keep it generating this excitement. And it just disappeared. And it disappeared so far from the radar that when Bill Wilson was working on the traditions and someone said to him, you know, you ought to look at the experience of the Washingtonians because they could teach you a few lessons about how an organization can, can fail and fall apart. And Bill Wilson had never heard of the Washingtonians. Never heard of them. You know, I mean, here he is. He's supposed to be learning everything about this. In our case, it's nothing like that. Nobody sat around and dreamed up anything. They just were instruments in the grand scheme of things. And we see that in the 1920s and <clears throat> when, um, as Ray O'Keefe put it, a cast of characters was being assembled in Vermont, in Manchester, Vermont. And there was Bill Wilson over from East Dorset. There was Evie Thatcher over from Albany. There was Roland Hazard up from Rhode Island where they had summer homes. There was a beautiful young lady whose father was a doctor in Brooklyn, Dr. Burnham, named Lois. And she summered there. And these teenagers got to know each other. And as the events unfolded, each one of them played a critical role all the way down to the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. And um, the first one was Roland, and he went to see... Dr. Young, he, he was supposed to inherit the family business, many millions and millions of dollars, and he knew his alcoholism was going to prevent him. His father knew it. They had him go to all the best doctors in the United States, and as a last resort, they went to Dr. Young. He spent a year with him as Dr. Young worked on him to cause the transformation that is necessary to um, be set free from this terrible disease, and at the end of the year, Dr. Young explained, if he ever drank again, he may end up in the sanatorium, which is where people went. He said, I understand. He got as far as Paris. Somebody asked him the wrong question. They said, would you like a drink? And he said, yes, I would. <laughs> Very short order. He's back to Dr. Young. Dr. Young, Dr. Young, I'm all messed up again. Blah, blah, blah. And if you think about this moment in time, it is as if, being explained to him that he's an alcoholic and you cannot manage your own life. And then Dr. Young, when he said, Dr. Young, what can you do for me? Dr. Young, with all the humility of a world-famous psychiatrist, said, there's nothing I can do for you, which set the stage for no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. There it was. This was the court of last resort of human power. And what it did, it did the secret thing that is necessary in recovery. It took all hope away from Roland. It left him desperate. It left him so that he had nothing to cling on to. And then Dr. Young said, now I have heard of some cases like yours where people have found a spiritual power and they have recovered. If I was you, I would go look for a spiritual program. Now, until he told them there was nothing he could do, I don't think he could have talked Roland into looking for a spiritual program. He wasn't interested in a spiritual program. He wasn't spiritual. But that was, I'm not, I don't really, I'm not into that stuff. But once he found out there was nowhere else to go, he eagerly went after a spirit. Where can I find a spiritual program? He was just on a search. And that God could and would if he were sought. And he found the Oxford group, which was real in. They were all over the place, and it was a great place, and he got sober. And the next cast, is when Bill's sponsor, Ebby, he was the next to crash and burn and in front of the judge, Roland Hazard and Shep and uh, one other guy were there, and they said, would you release him in our custody? And the judge said, sure, be glad to, and they took him to the Oxford and Ebby got sober, and Ebby, once he got sober and realized how exciting it was, he thought of his old buddy Bill Wilson, and he said, maybe Bill would like to do it. And then we all know he went to Bill's on that Saturday morning, and Bill's dying. He's at the bottom of everything, and he just can't deny how good Ebby looks. You talk about a program of attraction. 
he couldn't believe any of the ideas, but he saw what was happening. He saw his friend, and he just couldn't believe it. And Evie was telling him, There's, you just need a higher power. And Bill had the same experience with God as a child. He said, oh, no, no, I'm not into that. And Evie said, choose your own concept of God. You just need something. And in his next hospitalization, Bill cried out, if there is a God, let him show himself to me. And the room lit up, and he had this great experience. And he went out, and he tried to help other alcoholics to no avail. Couldn't help a single one because he was telling them about the spiritual experience. He was telling them about the bright lights and the mountaintop and the voice of God and all that. And the drunks at the bars are going, oh, that happens when I drink rum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Silkworth said, Bill, you're talking about the wrong thing. You have to do the same thing that Dr. Young did. You have to tell them about the disease. You have to tell them there is no hope. You have to make them desperate. You have to show there's nothing that can help them except the higher power. And then they will reach out. And so that started the whole thing. And, and as we follow, uh, the one other thing I'll throw in is um, a name you don't hear too often, Jim Newton. Everybody familiar with Jim Newton? I'm sure some people are, but it's probably one that isn't. Jim Newton was a real estate guy in Fort Myer, and um, he also knew Thomas Edison, who had his laboratories and everything down there, and he became kind of an assistant to Thomas Edison. He's a pretty good organizer, but he's in real estate. That was his thing, and he had been in New York and had found the Oxford Group and was a big, just loved it, loved the way it transformed his life, and he had a spiritual basis to it, and... Um, um, boy, I'm drawing a blank on the um, guy with the, the Firestone. Harvey Firestone was a close friend of uh, Thomas Edison and was visiting there, and he said, I'm looking for a special administrative assistant to come out to Akron. I got some plants out there, and I need this guy to be my special advisor. And Thomas Edison, I got the guy for you, Jim Newton. He, this guy is awesome. So he interviewed him, and he liked him, and he said, come on out. And he went to Akron. And um, while he was there, he got to know the family. He was kind of an in guy, and one of um, Firestone's son, Bud, was an alcoholic, bad alcoholic, and his father was real worried. And Jim had seen a few alcoholics recover in the Oxford group. And he said to Harvey Firestone, he said, let me take Bud with me on my next uh, business trip. I'm going to take him to a little group that I belong to. They could help him. So he took him with him on the business trip. And while they were there, they went to a couple Oxford meetings. And Bud had this transformation while he was there and came back a changed person. And his father was so happy. He said, what is this organization? He said, it's the Oxford group. And um, Frank Buckman was the head of the, you know, it started the Oxford Group. And, of course, Harvey Firestone goes, Oxford Group? We better get one in Akron. <laughs> this is awesome. And so with his power, the next thing, the newspapers, and it's all over town. And celebrities and Frank Buckman and all these personalities are going to be here. Come to the churches and see the Oxford Group. And everybody saw it, including Ann Smith and Henrietta Cyberling, and they went to Oxford, and they saw the power of it, and the T. Henry and Cl Clarice Williams, who opened their home to the Oxford group and early AA members. And as a result of that, Dr. Bob was brought, kicking and screaming, by Anne to the Oxford group, and um, he got all of the spiritual part of the group except the not drinking part <laughs> and so we had Henrietta we had Anne and it was a custom in the group when a person confessed a problem that the rest of the group pray for a solution and doctor but everybody knew he was an alcoholic but he hadn't confessed it yet and so at an Oxford group meeting one night, he said, I want to confess something probably none of you know. <laughs> but I have this terrible drinking problem. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm trying desperately to get help, and et cetera, et cetera. 
And it wasn't that many weeks later that Henrietta Cyberling received a call that had been transferred from the Reverend Tunks, who hosted the Oxford meeting of the thing with Harvey Firestone, that Bill had called from the Mayflower Hotel and gave him Henrietta was one of the ten names that he got. And when he got a hold of her, she said, I have just the perfect... He said, I'm a drunk from New York, and I think I have the answer to alcoholism, and I need to work with another alcoholic. And she said, I've been expecting your call. And it's hard to it's look at... Our... Firestone. Yeah. She doesn't know this guy from hell. He called yeah, right. from the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel, and she says, come on up. Yeah, yeah to the gatehouse of the uh, state. So when the drunks go to Akron to tour all the sites, and the, one of the things on tour is the Firestone Estate, they only go to the gatehouse. They don't go to the mansion. They just go there where Bill and Bob met. So that was. Those are the stories that uh, I wanted to share that you can see nobody was doing anything. They were just being guided. It was just being handed. They were just put in desperate situations, and events were just transpiring. Bob, pick it up and... <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, but surrender. I mean, when you when you look at what Jung uh, gave Roland, and you look at what uh, Silkworth gave Bill when he said you're, you're carrying the wrong message. You know, you're talking about this blind light experience on top of a mountain. You have to talk about the disease. And interestingly enough, Bill carries the message of the disease to the doctor. If Bill would have tried to trade spiritual experience with Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob was enormously I went through with, with his Bob, Dr. Bob's daughter. I went through Bob's library. Bob was a, you know, a very well-read, searching guy, as, as was Bill. I'm glad our founders didn't believe that you couldn't read anything other than the book, the big book. You know, we might not have had it. And uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, it really is. I mean, Jung wrote a book called Man in Search of His Soul, and I, I happen to have that book right now. And, and Bill autographs it. To, you know, to Bob Smith at Christmas, he said, hey, Smitty, read this. Great stuff, you know. And it is, uh, those men were searchers. And uh, there was something happening in the 30s. There was, some, there was a spiritual revolution that was happening. The Unity Movement, Science of the Mind Church, the Oxford Group. Uh, uh, there was just uh, Emmett Fox. I mean, th there was this uh, revolution that was going on uh, in spirituality. I don't know if it had to do with the uh, the depression or whether it was just you know it seems like you know spiritual openings come at different periods of time. But what I do know is that if you've got someone who's really locked into a serious problem like alcoholism or any other kind of serious problem that none of us have in this room. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we've been in a relationship with that for a long time, trying to change it, trying to alter it, and unsuccessful. Okay, But we are, like, locked in. It's like a tar baby. We have our arms wrapped around that sucker, and we're doing everything. We There's no opening. You know, one of the great Zen masters said you need the mind of a beginner, not the mind of an expert. The mind of an expert, there is no opening. There's no space. But what happens with surrender is your ego gets destroyed. When your ego gets destroyed, there's an opening. You aren't there. And when you aren't there, you have like a clean slate that someone can come in and say, try this. Would you be willing to look at this? And what happened to Bill and what happened to Bob and what happened to Roland is that they got knocked on their buns. They had a, you know, they had a surrender experience, and they were at that moment open, clear, and empty. Uh, I think the story of the book is one of the next great stories in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, you know, Bill stayed for six months in Akron. You know, I mean, you talk about the Depression. What better time could we have had to incubate Alcoholics Anonymous in the Depression? He didn't have a job. He was down there working on a, you know, on a, a proxy deal down there that had kind of fallen through. He still thought it might do it. So he's, he hangs out, and they go get Bill Dodson, and they go, you know, and they start, and they, then they get Ernie, and they start building this thing, and they've got a bunch of guys going. Bill goes back home to New York and starts a group in New York, and pretty soon they've got these two little pockets of groups going. 
And sometime in 1937, I forget exactly when, he goes back down to Akron, and he's sitting on the front porch of Bob's house. And in the conversation, it came to both of those men that there were enough recoveries now, let's say there were 20, that they really had stumbled on something that was bigger than themselves. That I mean, they weren't looking to start Alcoholics Anonymous. They were looking for a way out. I mean, they, I mean, they weren't trying to start an organization. They were trying to save their themselves from this horrible grips of the disease. And somehow they knew that working, you know, when 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 Silkworth talked to Bill, and Bill made the the other connection in the in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel, was Bill discovered at that moment that he needed to talk to another drunk, not to help the other drunk, but to maintain his own sobriety. That was not a small revelation that he made. So when he went to that man, it wasn't to inform the man. Okay, it was also to maintain his own sobriety. There was a humility in that approach that might not have been, a, been there when you were trying to tell someone about your spiritual revelation. So at that moment, Bill said, we've got to get this message out. We really, there's just you know, lots of people who need this message, and they made a d- decision to write the book. And over the next year and a half, they wrote the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, primarily authored by Bill, but the first three or four chapters were roughed out by Bill, sent to both groups in New York and Akron, and kind of jostled back and forth. And then when the the project kind of bogged down, Bill kind of took it by the horns, as I understand it. I don't know if that and and, and wrote most of the rest of the most of the rest of the book. And then they sent out the manuscripts. I, I don't know how many they sent out uh, to people. Uh, and many of you have probably seen the original manuscript where the steps are in the I form. And after you get done, when you read, you know, how it works and you get down and it says, you know, that probably no human power could have relieved it. God couldn't would if you were sought. And it said, if you've read so far and don't agree with this, please throw this away, you know, throw it away or else reread it. And, uh, uh, but there were a lot of comments, maybe the greatest of which is that the, the we got put into the steps rather than I. Uh, and so here this book, you know, they didn't have enough money to publish it. They got a loan from Rockefeller and a loan from Bert, the guy who was the, you know, had the clothing store. And they, you know, got enough money to get the 5,000 volumes of the book. And the publisher kept most of the volumes. They broke free, you know, from some of those. So, you know, and then they had the article in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And they got, you know, 800, you know, members come in. Then Rockefeller has the dinner, you know, uh, and they... they they give all the books out to the the big shots, and they hope they're going to raise money. And they got about fifteen hundred bucks from those dinners for a number of years that they eventually paid back. Uh, but but if if we know more about that story, it is just at the last moment. They, I mean, they didn't have the money, and somehow it came, and they just you know couldn't get the books. And you know, I mean, it was it was just. And for a man to have written that book with three and a half years of sobriety or four and a half years of sobriety. You know, he got Bill got sober on December 11th, 1934. So I guess you know, and, and the book got published in April of 1939. So there was you know five years between the, you know, I mean, mostly with five years sobriety, you wouldn't let him cut your yard. <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, he has you know, and here here is this guy who, you know, uh, that's a joke. It's not five years, maybe five months. But I mean, here, here's this guy. Uh, yeah. I asked a guy to paint my porch, you know, and he came back and after he painted it and said, that wasn't a porch, that was a Mercedes, <laughs> you know. The, uh, 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 but Rockefeller throws the dinner. Bill, you know, Bill wanted to get the Reader's Digest to, to review the book, and Bill wanted Rockefeller to give him a big endorsement, and Bill wanted to make a lot of money. They sold stock, they raised, you know, they raised the stock to go do the book. And then uh, at the dinner, Rockefeller said, you know, that money was going to ruin this thing by accident. By accident. What he said is this is a work of, you know, I mean, we, we got some of the greatest principles that have helped us stay alive over a period of time. And then the Jack Alexander article in 1941. But the book, the codification of the principles, spiritual principles that we have. First of all, for a man with four years of sobriety to have written a book that has stood the test of time unbelievably well. I mean, this is a time when people, you know, specialize in tearing apart things of God. Very difficult. And and there is, I mean, almost all of us, when we read that book, you might argue with pronouns or think, you know, but you you read that book and you just go, oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, it is, it is really, and the, and the nature of spiritual books is that they don't inform. 
The nature of a spiritual book is when you read it, you have an experience. And that is why it is new when you read it. Because you aren't, you're not getting information. Your mind isn't engaged. Your soul and your heart is engaged. And when that's engaged, it's always new. So when you read the book and you happen to be really plugged into it, but what happened to our society is from the April of 1934, when the book, I'm sorry, 39, when the book was written, to March of 41, we went from 100 people to 8,000. And that's what made that possible. There would have been no other way we could have kick-started our society without having the book. And they really thought that you could send people the book, they'd read the book, they'd have the experience, and they themselves, they, didn't, they, they, they never really thought that we were going to be in the, necessarily in the form that we are today. But you can just see, the, to me, the hand of God everywhere in our fellowship. One of the great differences that I see today is our society is very different today in 2004 than it was in 1934. You could talk about things that were spiritual. You could talk about things that were religious. People expected them. They were normal. They were, they were, there was general agreement about the principles and values of that sort of thing. You might argue about you know, which particular branch that you should do, but by and large, most people were churched. Today, you know, we can, you know, we can't have a cross on a state seal. You know, we can't have the commandments uh, out in front of a state capitol. Okay, so, I mean, we are in a society today that is very different than the society. We are the cult of self. We are the cult of individual. We, we do not, you know, so there's just a lot of us today that are not church that are given all the encouragement by our society, poor baby, you're suffering, things shouldn't be tough, go take a pill, we'll get you something, you know, <laughs> calm down, it'll be okay. <clears throat> and you should need the answer now, immediate gratification. You know, and then we have all these wonderful gambling casinos and porn on the internet and credit cards being mailed to you. I mean, there's just, I mean, there are, there's a vortex and a wind blowing out there today. I mean, there's always been issues. But I really believe that our society today has somewhat the form of addiction that actually pushes us to instability. When our, when our, when our society, Alcoholics Anonymous, was founded, I believe society supported stability. And so some of us, if we're sitting out there wondering why our thinking always isn't very good, wondering why we're having trouble, if you're not kind of centering yourself in some of the messages that we have, and you're unaware that the wind's blowing, and you wonder why your golf ball's going left. I mean, there's a 40-mile-an-hour wind out there, Tiger, and if you aren't hanging on to something, you're going to go left. And I, and, I, and I really think that that is one of the great differences today, is that I think those the men and women in the early days that got sober really wanted to conform. They really felt the pain of nonconformity and wanted to take on the responsibilities of their life. Today, the message of the world is your responsibility is to you. Just do your own thing. Take care of yourself. You're the most important person in the world. And as we will get into spiritual principles, our book says serving others is important. Having God be the center of your life. And I really think that message is not out there in society today, and it is hard for us to grab a hold of and hang on to. And that's part of what happened when... When Jung says, you know, there's been spiritual transformations, a central idea, what he said to Roland, there are people that the very central ideas and values of their lives are transformed. That's not an alteration. That's not an improvement. That is a transformation. And when those are changed around, when you have an alteration in how you be, everything you do changes. That's a transformation. And that's what I think when, when Sandy talks about we've got a solution, I mean, it's really a solution. It is a change of heart, as they talk about in the you know, chapter working for others. It is a change of heart, and that's what we're looking for. It doesn't have, you know, it needs to be encouraged. And I, I, I think the, our book, the history of how our book came to be, and the role that our book has played over a period of time is, is, is one of the great stories in God's stories in AA. Well that. that. Well, that was a nice break. I got some good snacks and coffee, and we're ready to go again.
And um, I think we decided last night, I don't know how I get to be, have to start, but Bob talked me into that, um, to try and describe the solution. But that, that is um, an interesting word, the, <clears throat> the solution. And uh, so I thought I'd start by telling you a story. And uh, it's about a guy named Joe. And he's about uh, 30 years old. And ever since he was born, he has felt not right in his skin. And he's just filled with anxiety. Uh, he's afraid of things. He doesn't feel the same as anybody. He, you know, he just doesn't fit in anywhere, not in his family, in society. But he's trying to hang on. He's just he's keeping his job. He's um, afraid to ask girls out. He, he can't dance. He, he just has that feeling like, man, is it hard to just be alive? And as that burden of being so uncomfortable in his own skin got greater and greater. You know, by the time you're 30, if you've just been handling this all your life, you're just uh, almost desperate. And sometimes the idea of uh, maybe I should just jump off a bridge or something. And he's talking to his friend. And he said, um, I know a guy named Ralph. I don't know why, but something tells me to talk to this. You ought to talk to him. I want you to get together with him. And so he goes over and sees Ralph. And they're sitting in the kitchen at Ralph's place. And Ralph is going, now tell me about yourself. And he told him about him. He said, oh, man. He said, that's me. He said, I was just like that. And he said, um, there is a solution to this. He said, have you ever tried drinking? <laughs> and he said, no, my parents were teetotalers, and they told me when I was a little boy that if I ever drank, my hair would fall out, I would go blind. Uh, that, masturbation. Yeah. <laughs> that um, no one would ever talk to me again, and it would be the end of the world, and so I don't, no, I'm not, no, I'm not interested in that. And he reached under the table and he took out a bottle of scotch and he put it on the table and he said, I'm telling you right now, there is a solution and it's right here. He said, um, for about 90% of the people in this country, when they drink, it's just another event. It's just like uh, having a donut. It's, uh, it's not a major thing. But he said, there's 10% of us that have something happen when we drink that is absolutely remarkable. And the guy's going, oh, come on, come on. I'm, you know, what, what are you talking about? That, that just, he said, um, the type of problem that you have, the only way out of it is to have an awakening. There's no other way for you to achieve this. You're trying to go through life on your own. You're being overpowered by life. And what you need is something bigger than yourself. And I'm telling you, it's here. So what you need to do is to get rid of those old ideas. You thought those, those ideas up when you were a kid. And um, you're a grown-up now. You've got to rethink these things. I need you to get an open mind. I want you to try this. And he's going, no, I'm not going to do that. That stuff, it's, I, I know my parents told me that, and I'm not going to do that, and I'm, just a, I'm not interested. And he said, well, let me read something out of here about what an awakening is, and maybe this will help you um, with your thoughts. He says, when you have an awakening, the most important meaning is that you will now be able to do, feel, and believe that which you could not believe before on your unaided strength and resources alone. 
you will be granted a gift which amounts to a new state of consciousness and being. You will be set on a path which will tell you you're really going somewhere. That life is not a dead end. Not something to be endured or mastered. In a very real sense, you will be transformed because you will have laid hold of a source of strength which in one way or another you have hitherto denied yourself. You will find yourself in possession of a degree of honesty, tolerance, unselfishness, peace of mind, and love which you thought yourself quite incapable. What you will receive is a free gift, and yet, at least in some small part, you have to make yourself ready to receive it. And so when we talk about... Um, you starting to drink this wonderful answer. We call it a spirit. That's what this liquid is called, is a spirit. And this is a solution to your problems. If you will do what I suggest to you, you will know how to dance. You will not be afraid to ask girls out. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something. If you start drinking this bottle of scotch, you will be amazed before you're halfway through. <laughs> you are going to know a new freedom and a happiness. You will not regret the past. You will comprehend the word serenity and you will know peace. And the guy's looking at the bottle. And he's just going, what? I'm not through. <laughs> you will intuitively know how to handle everything. And the man says, I think those are rather extravagant promises myself. <laughs> and he said, no, they're not. All of these will come true, but you have to work for them. I'm going to tell you something about this before you start. Half measures will avail you nothing. <laughs> Sippers do not make it in our program. You must completely abandon yourself to this bottle. You must... Take the idea that somehow you can exist without this, and that idea has to be smashed. You have to surrender absolutely, and these great things will come to pass. And the guy looked at it and looked at it, and he said, can I get you a glass? Are you ready? He said, i got to think it over. i got to think it over. I'm, i I got to think it over. I don't want to rush into something like that. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. Here's my card. If you ever get desperate enough, give me a call. So he went back out and got in the car with his friend. He said, how'd it go? He said, that guy is weird. I mean, you're not going to believe. You know what he told me? He said, we would be walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. That I would be on a path to... He said, it's, it's way too wild. It's impossible. There's nothing like that could happen. I mean, that's just out of the question. And so he went home and he went on with his life. And for the rest of his life, he stayed anxious. He stayed afraid. He endured the pain of living on his own and staying with his old ideas. He just endured it. And finally, at age 60, he was ready to die. And um, his wife was by his side. And she saw him drift off. And um, then when he came back, she said, where were you? She said, I, he said, I was just thinking about that time I sat with that guy about 30 years ago. He said, I wonder if my life would have been any different had I taken that drink. And then he died. And so we go, now what's the point of that story? Well, we come in here and we're told about this thing. 
we're told this great story. We're told about this incredible solution. And our ego says, no way. No way am I going to be walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Uh, when I was a little kid, I had saw a cross and it told me, mm, no way could this remarkable an event come to pass in my life. Those are extravagant promises. I mean, what are we talking about here of that magnitude of, of an awakening and a contact and a transformation? And we go back and uh, there is the entire program is captured in one sentence in the chapter to the agnostic. And it's talking about our big book. And it said, the main object of this book is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself. And then comes the most important part of the sentence. Which will solve your problems? What? So there it is. There is the solution. Find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problems. Now, how does it solve your problems? When we're near this power, there are no problems. That's how it solves them. The solution is not a traditional one that we're accustomed to seeing. What the man told the other man about the alcohol, the spirit, is exactly true. These things happen in the the words that are used. Look at the verbs in the promises. Can you imagine going to a psychiatrist? And he says, oh, yes, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm restless, I'm irritable, I'm discontent. All I do is think about myself. Well, don't worry, I'm going to talk to you a little while, and self-seeking will slip away. (laughs) I know you're all worried about money and all that stuff. Don't worry. It's going to leave you. It'll just leave you. There's no plan to get any money. There's no nothing. Don't worry. It's just going to leave you. These are spiritual verbs. These are verbs that are only used when there's a higher power involved. This isn't a normal solution. Somebody told me I could have fear of economic insecurity leave me with no money arriving. <laughs> That doesn't seem possible, does it? That is beyond the realm. So when it says, finding a power greater than ourselves which will solve our problems, this is what is happening. We actually are placed in a position of neutrality. The problem doesn't exist for us. It simply doesn't exist as long as we maintain our spiritual condition. So the entire solution is the spiritual condition. It is the solution itself. It's the answer to everything. Before we came to AA, we had one solution to everything. Do you ever remember drinking and, I mean, having a problem and go, oh, here's a problem I won't be drinking over. (laughs) I'll be handling this one sober. (laughs) No. The first thing we did when a problem came was, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, but I will shortly. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Boom, boom. We intuitively knew how to handle something that was baffling us 10 minutes ago. And so the, the solution is in the power. And and this applies to when you're brand new and applies when we've been around for a long time. What does Bill say to those of us that have been around a long time and we're encountering a problem? Yeah, go on to the meeting. The meetings don't see as exciting. Uh, something's going wrong in my life. Something, he only has one answer. You know what the answer is? More spiritual growth. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, no, you, know, you grew up to here. Now you got to grow more. It's only one answer, and uh, so that's what the solution, as I would interpret it, is power, power. And so the story, the guy was right. He was going to give him a solution. The problem was it was the wrong higher power. But it was an exact analogy to our program. Exact. You just get the power and the problems are resolved. 
It's not our job to resolve the problems. It's our job to do God's work. And the problems are all resolved. So that's my shot on it. Now, transfer over to you. <laughs> and now Norm Cosby will... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, your analogies and word pictures are just uh, extraordinary. They just are extraordinary. Isn't that wonderful? Why do we have so much trouble? I mean, if there is that solution, uh, why are we sitting out in this room with divorce problems and health issues and depression and checking accounts, $500 overdrawn, 35 grand in credit card bills, kids at home that we aren't quite sure what to do with. and Why do we have those problems if we have the solution? And I think that that's one of the great, one of the great questions. I think a lot of us disempower ourselves. I, I don't, I can tell you only from my own experience. Uh, it is my experience from my own actions and living of my life and my experience from watching people that I've had the privilege to sponsor is I think most of us come into Alcohol East Anonymous and we have a, a surrender experience of whatever depth we have. Some of them are profound. Some of them are not quite so profound in the deep and later. Some of them are not quite so profound and they never deepen. We have a surrender experience and many of us for the first couple of years of our sobriety go through an enormous growth process. I don't think anybody can walk in here initially and hold what uh, Sandy just said. It's too big. I mean, it is, you know, they, they might hear it in their heart, but, you know, uh, which is where we would hear that anyway, it's not our heads. But, I mean, it's so big that you almost don't get it. I think most of us come in here and we have a plan. You know, my sponsor used to jokingly say, what I wanted was $10,000 and a new wife, okay? But most of us come in and we have a list of problems that if we resolve those issues, that would be really terrific. You know, if I really got a, a career going, if I straightened out things at home or, you know, I mean, th th there's a list that, that if we could do those, you know, life would really be okay. And interestingly enough, most of us make very significant progress over with those things over the first few years of our sobriety. What you find out is the same thing that most of us find out that are older is that circumstantial resolution does not bring us the peace and happiness that we thought it would. The midlife crisis what is the midlife crisis? You know, when you get to be, I'm 60, almost 61, you know, it's being 61 and realizing you're not going to climb the mountains that you thought you were going to climb. You're not going to be the president of this, or you know. And the other thing is, is that the mountains you have climbed didn't make it for you. And so you do end up with the question, what is it all about? If I'm not going to be able to become what I thought I had to become to be okay, and what I've done isn't enough, what the hell is okay? What is it about, Elfie? <laughs> and I think that most of us in our middle, early middle sobriety run into a crisis. I think that we go through the enormous growth change and burst of energy in our very early sobriety. That activity and the fellowship and the grace that goes along with that. Many of us have a honeymoon period after the surrender where we just have this learning period where we're just like little sponges and we suck up, you know, and we ask a question, we get an answer, we got an answer. But all of a sudden you're two years sober, you ask a question and get an answer, you're not sure the person's right. You know, you're home. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're not, your ego starts to reassert itself and all of a sudden you're running the, you know. And I think what most of us do, most of us are sitting in this audience that we could pass the test. We've got the booby prize, all of us have the answer. But we don't have the solution. We've got the information, but we don't have the principle alive. We don't know it in a way that makes a difference. We know it, but we don't know it in a way that makes a difference. And there you have to, I think, know it with your heart. You have to engage at a level that is deeper. Your intellect isn't enough. It's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. It is not enough. The choices that I think we continuously run up in life is you've got a choice. You know, Chamberlain used to say you can have a God-centered life and suffer the consequences or a self-centered life and suffer the consequences. You're either going to have your ego and intellect running the show or you're going to be God-centered. Those are the choices. Now, when they're God-centered, the intellect's involved. It's just a junior partner. 
But when the ego is running the show, your mind is in charge of everything. Isn't that a thought? Okay. Okay. Now, for those of you who have tried to meditate in this room, you know, if you ever have tried to quiet your mind, you're going to find out something. Number one, you don't generate your thoughts. They just are like trains going through Grand Central Station. (laughs) They arrive without any volition, without any choice. Once in a while, one has Velcro on it, and you engage it. uh, But, you know, but that's true. (laughs) And you aren't even the thinker, which most of us identify as the thinker. Most of us identify as a set of circumstances. We don't have the distinction between our life and our life circumstances. Most of what is weighing us down in the room is not our life. It's not who we are. It's the circumstances of our life. That's not who we are. The circumstances are not what's eating us up. The fact that we're separated from ourselves, from our true self, not the false self, from our true self. And that's what the program gets us connected with. When it gets us connected with the spirit of the universe, it brings us home. The process of recovery is a process of returning home. It isn't becoming someone else. It's becoming who you always have been and have not known. It is that, oh, yeah, yeah. It is that those moments that all of us have experienced in the meetings and in conversations with other people, those little glimpses that, yeah, I can do that. I mean, it is is so hard, but, but most of us, the encouragement in the world today is to use your mind and to use your head and to be self-centered and that the answer is out there. And most of us are this detached head going about life, and, and we bring the movie with us. We're not experiencing life. We're bringing us wherever we go, and we've got the film running all the time. And that's, I mean, it's just a mind stream. I mean, you know, when a new person comes over to your house and you ask them how they are and they babble out what they are concerned about, I mean, it is just like they put their mind on loudspeaker. It is just like, <laughs> it is just like vomiting out this, this complex, painful angst that is going through their head, and that's their reality. Their, those thoughts, that pattern is their reality. You go talk to Sandy, I think, with 40 years of sobriety, and he's letting those trains go through the station. It isn't like he doesn't have insecurities. It isn't like I don't have insecurities. It isn't like I don't get thoughts of financial insecurity or sexual insecurity or, you know, marital issues or children issues. I get those, but they are not my life. When I can do something about it and they're present, I engage them. When they don't, I let the train go through the station. Well, most of us have the back door closed. We just accumulate them, and that is our reality. Okay. You can't have a God-centered life with that head. If that is your reality, you cannot have the experience to me of the solution. You can memorize the words. That's the menu. People will starve to death who memorize the menu. Some people are trying to eat the menu. <laughs> You, you laugh, but I'm telling you that that's what a lot of us in alcohol, we're desperate. I mean, you don't think you'd try to eat the menu? I mean, you don't think you'd try to memorize the words? It is, I mean, but the words point. The words point to God. They point to the power. They point to the changes that we have to make. And it's almost as if when you go to have the experience, the words drop away. And what is left is the experience. And that is the thing. I mean, and where are you going to get that message? You're not going to get it in the world. And where do you spend? If you are what you fill yourself full of, what are you filling yourself full of? I'm not trying to make you shave your head and sell books at the airport. But if you don't have, if you don't have a significant interaction in Alcoholics Anonymous with the book and meetings and the steps and your sponsor, if you don't have a significant anchoring. What are you filling yourself full of? Well, I assume it's work and television and, you know, whatever other hobbies we have, gambling, sex, obesity, you know, whatever, whatever else we happen to be running at the moment. But, I mean, all of us have us kind of especially that we, you know, got locked out in the garage. And, uh, <laughs> but if you're wondering why, if we really have the solution and it's that easy, 
Most of us can't hear the music. And most of us can't hear the music because we memorize the words and we have the concepts, but we're not having the experience. And I, I'm telling you, he's not kidding and I'm not kidding when I say there is a solution. There is a way around and through whatever pain, whatever difficulty, whatever circumstances you're dealing with, they mostly are an illusion. And that when you get in touch, in touch with your core self, when you come home, it's the silliest thing in the world. You're not missing anything. There's nothing missing. You're not under-equipped. I mean, you didn't miss two or three lines when they sent you down here to live your life like you don't have the right intellect or the right pieces. There are six trillion cells in your body right now doing millions of examinations to send calcium here and grow this there. And You are such a wonder you would have absolutely no idea what a wonder you are, what a success mechanism you are. You're not missing anything in the business of being able to live your life. You're just detoured. You're st we're stuck in a place, and we're trying to get our minds to resolve the issue to get us out. The answer is surrender. And, you know, how do you surrender? I mean, that's a hell of a question. Every time someone comes over to your house, the answer is to surrender. I think someone, sometimes the older guys, who can sit someone down and have a conversation and help create a clearing. When you said you go over to Sandy's and you talk to him about a problem and you always, almost always leave without the problem, I think what happens is they create a clearing. And they just go, oh, yeah, because nothing has happened to the circumstances. I mean, you go out to the car, not a thing has happened to the circumstances. You just get reminded, oh, yeah, I'm God's kid. I'm, <laughs> I'm a prince, for Christ's sake. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I own the kingdom and I'm worried about my checkbook. Oh, I forgot. You know, but, but it is, I mean, it's, it is extraordinary. So I'll give it back to Sandy. Well, thinking about um, how a prayer might go. You might sit down in the morning and you may go get on your knees and go, God, I got a job interview at 1030. I haven't had a job in six months. And I really need this job, and it's something I'd really enjoy doing. Could you please help me get rid of my fears so that I can be creative and really create a good impression and do the best that I can when I go on the interview? I just ask you to please do that for me, and I'll check in with you at the end of the day and let you know how it went. Now, that would be a prayer. But if we added what we might call meditation, which is listening to the prayer, we might finish the prayer and then sit there in silence. We may hear something like this. Yeah, I heard your prayer. Why don't you take me with you on the interview? Why do you want to leave me here and go out there by yourself? You see how we're limiting ourselves? We got a little, we got a plan, and then we go, here's the plan, God. Help me, and I'll be back. <laughs> but I want to do it myself because I don't want to give you the credit all the time. You know, you go to meetings and you go, God, 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 God. <laughs> what about me? Where am I in the equation? And this is kind of a struggle that uh, we all have in, in this uh, coexistence. Watch out, we'll talk about this. I don't want to get into that, the riddle of our existence. Um, but we do have a coexistence that we have as a living in the material world and the spiritual world at the same time. And uh, we have to accept this, that this conflict is, exists, and we'll talk about that later. But I think the, um, 
One of the things that I find, I was talking to somebody right before we came back up here. Well, there's a couple of things. I, there were situations that I never knew I had choices in. When I was a teenager, if I was standing with six other teenage boys and a, another kid came up and he pointed right at me and he said, you're ugly, your mother's ugly, and you're stupid, and so is she. And then the, my buddy said, are you going to let him get away with that? I didn't know that I could say, yeah. Yeah, I am going to let him just be stupid and stand there. Yeah, I am going to let him get away with that. He's a real jerk. Yeah, I didn't know that I had the freedom to not do what the crowd was telling me. I didn't know I had a choice of seeing things differently. I didn't know that I could put being undisturbed at the top of the list and that that was where you are the winner, that it's not competition. It is remaining in this undisturbed place. Um, now, as far as maintaining this, I was uh, somehow I ended up, uh, you know, we don't, Bob and I didn't plan to end up being speakers anywhere. We just came to meetings, and it somehow just happened. We just ended up that somebody said, well, would you come over and talk at our group? And, and somebody over there was from, my case, was from Baltimore, and, and the next thing I'm over there, and I'm going, blah, 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 and they go, oh, yeah, some guy from Pennsylvania said, oh, well, I heard this young jerk over there in Baltimore, and maybe we ought to get him up at our little deal, and we go around, and uh, that was that was what was happening to me in, um, in um, 1975. I'd been running around to these little things for about five years, and I was in Indiana with Wino Joe, <laughs> and the al speaker was Elsa Chamberlain. And she took a liking to me. She just, um, I don't know what it was, she just said, oh, God, that's so nice, or whatever. And she went back to Chuck. Now, I knew Chuck Chamberlain. I mean, everybody knew the word. You said Chuck Chamberlain, and it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I had missed out on meeting Bill Wilson. Every year, Hal Marley would say, let's go up to uh, New York, and you can meet Bill Wilson. And I don't have enough money. I don't have enough money to go to Washington to New York. And he said, well, he's going to die someday, and you're going to wish you had met him. Well, so I didn't. And, of course, it's my biggest regret. But Chuck Chamberlain then kind of jumped into the, um, you know, the AA guru. So anyway, Elsa Chamberlain went back, and I didn't know this, but she went back and said to him, I want you to uh, ask Sandy Beach to talk at the Palm Springs Roundup, which is where Drop the Rock came from. And uh, Chuck said, Who? Oh, it's this guy I heard back there, and he's from Washington. Well, give me a tape. Well, he doesn't have any tapes. I don't know anything like that. Well, I'm not inviting him out to the Palm Springs Roundup. And without that, and she said, well, you'd be sleeping alone. <laughs> and so um, I'm sitting at home in Virginia, right outside of Washington. The phone rings, and I answer it, and he says, is this Sandy? Yes, yeah, this is Chuck Chamberlain. And I went, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and all he said was, my wife told me I have to invite you to the Palm Springs <laughs> Roundup. <laughs> so anyway, I went out there. And, and so all these things happen, and I sponsor all kinds of people, and I'm doing all that. And I, I said, how did I get into this? And what the heck is all this? And I was telling Bob, I finally realized what I've been asked to do. And if I were to encapsulate what my job is, it's the best job in the world. I've been assigned the job of going to all kinds of places and seeing all kinds of people to tell them the good news. That's my job, is to be the bearer of good news. And as I tell it, I believe it. This is why sponsorship is so important, because my mind is telling me all kinds of things about there's better things than AA, that this is, you know, this book is so simple, it, you know, you can improve on this, you could be doing that, but I can't say that to the new guy, and I can't say that at a convention. 
I have to stay with the message. And as I'm saying the message, the power of it is just lighting me up like a light bulb. I'm just sitting there going, da, 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 da. <laughs> and when I get through, I go, jeez, this thing is amazing. This thing is amazing. And I have it for that day. And then my mind comes in, not as amazing as you could make it, not as amazing as you could. <laughs> you ought to start your own program. You ought to have it. <laughs> but I can't say that to anybody. So I'm forced back to the message. Back. It's so simple. It's just there. And it's simply an opening of the channel so, so that this thing, I'm, I have to open the channel and let this come out. And it is in this flow of energy out from us that we can experience it. It's, see, this energy is already inside of us. The spirit is already there. But unless it flows out, you can't feel it. It's blocked. It's self-centeredness. Screw those people. i got to take care of myself. And so now it's, you, you don't even know this power exists. It is in the release that you can feel it. And so that's why it's so exciting to sponsor somebody. Because you you got to go, oh, what are we talking about tonight? And, you, you know, somebody will call me up and go, well, t- tonight, I forget. i got 20 people or whatever. <laughs> They're doing one step a week. And, you know, somebody's coming over and I just go, now, what are we on tonight? And, you know, so they have to keep track. <laughs> and I go, step eight. And I go, oh, God, he's coming over to talk about step eight. <laughs> Then he sits down, and I'm all ready to just go on and on and on and on. And so where have I been? I've been back in this damn thing. I've been back in there and get this stuff, and it's there, and it's true, and it's real. How do you prove it's true? Results. That's it. No other proof. There's no other proof. Results. And uh, look at AA. It's there. It's not a theory. It's real. You get to see it. It's not on a blackboard. Now you see step one, see step two, and now you can see, obviously, as a result of these, you have a spiritual awakening, right? You can see it. You can see it. You can't see it. You have to do it. And then you see the results. And when I see, um, God, I'm taking up all the time. One more story. (laughs) Um, This is what it feels like, sponsoring people and carrying the message. There's there's this, (laughs) oh, this minister is walking along. He's been a minister for many years. And he sees this young boy kind of crying. He's really sad. And he goes up to him and he says, what's the matter, son? He said, I got my final algebra exam tomorrow. And I try as hard as I can, I can't grasp algebra. Even with the book open at home, I can't do the homework and get it right. Uh, it, I'm at a total loss, and there's no way I can pass this test. My parents are going to be disappointed, and I'm just so sad about everything. And the minister looked at him. He said, son, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you about the power of God. I'm going to tell you this. That if you get enough faith and you pray hard enough, you will pass that test. And the little boy said, what? He said, you trust me, son. If you get enough faith and you pray hard enough, you will pass that test. And they separated. And probably about a week later, the minister happened to run into him again. And he said, hey, how did you do? And the little boy said, I passed. And the minister said, you passed? He said, yeah. I cut all the faith that I could muster, and I prayed with all my heart, and I passed the test. And he ran off whistling and happy. And the minister said, holy shit. (laughs) And sometimes I watch what happens to new people, and that's what I feel like saying. I just go, how the hell did that schizophrenic, (laughs) depressed maniac look at him up there? He's making sense. He's blah, 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 blah. And I I forget the power of this program. 
Anyway, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I think everything in the world says to us that we have to be the source of our own power, and what we are are channels. We're like sprinklers. You know, we don't look you know, with very special designs, but we don't look very pretty unless water is going through. And most of us have our hose clogged. And that's one of the things that doing the work of the program unclogs the holes so that we can display the design. And your head does not see. All of us have this experience in meetings. I mean, it is, uh, I guess we've got 10 minutes. There's two things. I, uh, one's a personal story. My, my, my son, uh, Peter, uh, I just talked to him yesterday, and he's uh, in England, scared stiff. Uh, Peter was a guy who was uh, just kind of a catastrophe, 60 miles an hour, head first, no helmet, spring-loaded. Uh, he's now got... 13 or 14 years of sobriety, and he just got accepted to Oxford Business School, 33 years, 32 years old. And uh, he feels like he's way over his head, and he is. And uh, <laughs> uh, there was a time in our lives when Linda and I, just to maintain our sanity, used to have to hold hands and pray every night for Peter. I mean, he looked like he was killing himself. Peter went to six colleges. He never got the concept of attending until he went to the fourth college. He got registry, but not attending. Uh, and so now, some of the changes he's made, he made late, but because he stayed sober, and because he and he matured late. So many of these young people today, they're you know they're 30 years old, but they're like 20 years old. They aren't 30 years old, but maturation wise. And uh, it is so unlinear that he is where he is having the opportunity to do what he's doing. It is like impossible. If you could have walked in Linda's at our bedroom when we were in tears praying for Peter, I said, stop worrying for God's sake. He's going to be at Oxford in 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna... yeah. I would have thought with, without a second, Creighton sponsored him for a while, I would have thought it was the prison at Oxford, Mississippi. It would not have occurred to me. It would, it would not have occurred to me. And one of the other stories I want to tell you is about Creighton. Uh, Creighton uh, lived in Minnesota for quite some time, and now he lives in Tennessee, I think, Mississippi. Uh, and uh, Creighton uh, developed a health disease due to Agent Orange. He had a and he's developing a, a kidney issue, and he's needed a, a transplant. And uh, Creighton was on an airplane. I not, may not tell this exactly, but Creighton's on an airplane. And the stewardess comes down and says, would you like a drink? Creighton shows her his AA medallion and said, I don't think I'll be drinking today. I have to be home on Wednesday. You know, that kind of a response. <laughs> and the gentleman sitting next to Creighton, uh, Ryan, uh, is a couple of seats away, and he sees Creighton show the medallion, and Ryan pulls the medallion out of his pocket and says to the stewardess, he doesn't think he's going to have a drink either. And those two started talking. Uh, three or four days from now, Ryan is going to give Creighton his kidney. Oh. <laughs> uh Creighton was particularly difficult to match because of some of the markers and some of the health experiences that he's had uh, in Vietnam. And uh, he was far more difficult to match than a normal person, and, and Ryan matched him almost identically. Uh, my son Bill, who was 17 years of sobriety, uh, moved to Europe for four years. And uh, he was sober about five years at that time. And... Uh, I supported him for three or four months. I told him that I wouldn't do it afterwards, and he worked at the World's Fair. He needed a job, and he went and applied at the U.S. Embassy in Madrid, and uh, nothing happened. didn't give him a job. So he goes to an AA meeting in Madrid, and the man who interviewed him is at the AA meeting. Bill is now not in a three-piece suit. He's in, he's in a T-shirt and Bermuda shorts. And they go through the meeting. At the end of the meeting, the guy who interviewed him came over and says, 
I'm really impressed with you. Why don't you come over and interview? And uh, <laughs> Bill is wondering whether he should tell the man that he already has interviewed <laughs> two days before. And Bill said, I, I have interviewed with you, sir. It was, you know. <sighs> There are so many things happening in life <coughs> that you can't see with your mind, that you can't feel with your fingers, that you don't know anything about, that you have so much power available to you in the living of your own life, <coughs> and you don't get it. You are walking around with $1,000 bills crushed up in your, po in your pocket, and they're turning off your lights because you haven't paid your utility bill. You don't get it. I mean, there really is a solution. There really is a power. And that we're intended to be pipes, not the well. That when the power comes through us, we get to be the instrument. We get to play our music. And that each of us is an instrument, intact, fully constructed, nothing missing. And that what we've done is we've obscured that. We have added you know, it's like we're a metallic instrument and we dragged it through the junkyard of life and we showed up in AA and it's a big metal ball with a bunch of metal that we have accidentally attracted and we dragged it through the junkyard of life and through doing the steps, we start to pry off pieces of junk. And little by little, we get to start to get closer to the source of who we be. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Are we, we're not, are we done with the hour yet? Yeah. 1230. 12.30. I give you Sandy. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> well, I don't know. The stuff I um, have in my mind now, I'm saving for the afternoon. So I think I'll just... Um, tell you a couple stories maybe um, I'm going up next week to uh, not next let's see next month on November 17th to Washington DC and I had a compatriot Hal Marley who passed away a few years ago who got sober the same year I did and he and myself and Ed Chandler from who's down in Texas now, we're the class of 64 up in uh, the Washington area. And we had dinner after we got to know each other for a while. We started having dinner once a month, especially in the years when we had 20 years to 30 years, somewhere in there. We, we had dinner almost every month. And Hal ended up, he was a retired Air Force fighter pilot and, um, was a, a air attaché to Poland in, in the Cold War and had very interesting careers, went with OEO for a while, but ended up at the State Department as the director of the alcohol programs at the State Department. He would be calling ambassadors back to go to treatment, you know, that kind of a thing. And so he loved to operate up at the super high level. I used to kid him and say his only resentment was there's no class above first class so that he could be up there. And um, he was very close to Bob Pearson, who was uh, the manager of the General Service Office at the time. And with his worldwide communication system at State Department, he was plugged in to every AA event on the planet. I mean, if I had a question, you know, do I know anybody in Peoria? And he would go, yes, Sandy, remember this Jack used to live here, now he's in Peoria, and he'd have his phone number. And it was like, the internet in one guy, you know, <laughs> as far as AA was concerned. And he preached gratitude. I mean, there's a, people all over the country that had attitude of gratitude pins, and he just would, Mr. Gratitude, Dr. Gratitude. February but he, 27th in the reflections. Yeah, that was in the thing the day he died. But the story I want to tell you is um, about Hal that he was so plugged in that nothing happened in AA without him knowing it. I mean, when they're getting ready to plan the international, he knew where they were having it first so he could come around. 
oh, the international's going to be in Toronto. It's going to be, in, you know, whatever it was. And it just had to be the first. And then we'd be at the dinner, Ed and I, once a month. And each guy would treat and go to their favorite restaurant. And then we'd talk about AA. And it was always about what's going on and this and that. Well, I was at a uh, an AA group one night, and I took a chance, a, a raffle, and I won a 12 and 12. And I got home, and I was just thumbing through. I, You know, I keep them, and then I can give them away to people. And so I was thumbing through this thing, and I went, God, look at this. What a weird thing. The thing had been screwed up by the printer. And the pages, some of the pages were out of sequence. They were back and forth. And it's, I knew I, something told me, keep it, keep it. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I knew this thing was going to come in handy. And then it dawned on me about six months later, and I said, i got to go find that 12 and 12. I want to see if in there there's a place where, you know, on the pages, like a half a page where the step ends, and then you turn the page and another step starts, and it's out of sequence. So here was step eight followed by step 11. So I bring the book to uh, the dinner. And I put it on the table, and Hal, which is, what's that? And I said, I'll tell you after dinner. It's a big deal, Hal. This is the first volume. <laughs> of the new 12 and 12. And, of course, he's looking at me like, what, what? I mean, he's very suspicious. So we have dinner, and we get through the meal, and I say, um, you know, Hal, I've been doing this step class. I, got, I don't know how I got into that, but I did a Saturday morning step class for 19 years. And, you know, you do it week after week. And he was well aware of that. And I said, Hal, I've been doing this thing for 12 years. And I said, about a year ago, I started through them, and it occurred to me they're in the wrong order. <laughs> and it was like I was being blasphemous, you know what I mean? Like, what? And I said, I know, and, and I knew, and so I suppressed it. I said, that's ridiculous. I put it down. But it kept coming back, Hal. Every time I went through, it was clearer and clearer and clearer that they're in the wrong order. So I called Bob Pearson. Well, I could see the look on his face. You called Bob Pearson without checking with me first? You know. And I told him, I said, Bob, I'm having this crazy thing. It's happening to me. And he thought it would, you know, he dismissed it. But the more I talked about it, he said, well, I hear a few points over the phone. Could you type it up, oh, your rationale for all of this? So I sent him in about eight typewritten pages, Hal, and uh, it, showing how the sequence should be changed. And, and he's still looking at me, you know, like, what, what, what? And you know something? They formed a committee. <laughs> They ran it by the trustees, like they could run it by without Hal knowing. <laughs> and this is the new 12 and 12. <laughs> and as you can plainly see, here's step eight, followed by step 11. <laughs> And Ed and I swear that for a millionth of a second, there was fear in his eyes. <laughs> and he grabbed the book away from me. And he said, <laughs> so that's just an anecdote about Hal Morris. <laughs> We're at the end of the time. Okay. Yes, me to start, which I think is unfair. I have a quote from a from a meeting on Friday mornings with a few of the guys in the audience go to, I just thought it was a great quote, alcoholics, at our, at our best, we are the elite of the mentally ill. <laughs> Read that again. Alcoholics, at our best, we are the elite of the mentally ill. And the other quote I, I just love, it said, the monkey is off my back, but the circus is still in town. <laughs> I mean, where else would you go to get those kind of pithy, you know? 
Uh, sorts of things. I started, uh, I don't really know where to go to this, Andy and I don't didn't exactly have a path, but we were talking about the solution, and we intend to kind of end up with something that is more specifically spiritual. Um, so I'm going to talk about and see if, if uh, Sandy wants to relate to it is uh, uh, what I started to talk about was problems in sobriety a little bit, that I said that many of us, when we first come in, get a real burst of energy, really like what we hear, get kind of on a honeymoon, we make a great you know, growth period for the first you know, two or three years. And by the way, these are obviously generalizations. I'm going to talk about people getting in trouble at five, six, seven, eight years, and not everybody gets in trouble at five or six or seven, eight years. These are just kind of, but I'm saying, I believe what I'm saying, in general, uh, patterns that are that are fairly common. And Bill talks about some of this stuff uh, in the big book. But when we talk about, you know, when he talks about, you know, uh, now we're, you've been sober long enough where you know that, you know, all your problems haven't been removed, you know, you've got problems other than alcohol and that we're going to be doing these spiritual practices over our lifetime. Uh, but most of us kind of get on a plateau. So let's just say we go, th- you know, we've made great progress through the first uh, uh, two or three years. Is that for me? Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then what, what happens is you start running into what happened to me is I started having problems I didn't think I should have. I'm an idealist. I came in, and you told me that you had an answer for alcoholism. You told me that mo- the unmanageability, I thought you told me, the unmanageability of my life was a result of my alcoholism, and alcoholism was physical but also mental and spiritual. If I took the principles of the steps, applied them to my life, and changed, I then thought, well, if so facto, I can get rid of the problems in my life. All my life, it seemed to me that everybody was telling me, Bob, you're fairly well equipped to live life. And I could do it for short spurts. <laughs> if life was a sprint, um, I had moments of brilliance interrupted by long periods of mediocrity and failure. And, um, but I only looked at the moments of brilliance. Uh, people always said to me, you know, you're, you're, you're well equipped. And I, I thought, yeah, so if I got rid of the problems, I could get back on top and, you know, I'll start doing it. Well, I get sober. I think all my problems are going to get solved. They come up. I start working on them, and they don't get solved. One by one, I had I had a, a interesting issue. I went to a psychologist not too long ago with one of my sons working on a, a father-son issue. And uh, in that thing, he said, I work with a lot of upper-middle-class kids. And he said, one of the biggest problems I have <coughs> is the, the problem they have leaving home. That they leave home. They're used to the family level of living, and they leave home, and they go down about six stories. You know, they, they, uh, that's in our society today, there's going to be lots of kids that aren't going to do as well as their parents. And boy, did I identify with that when I left home. I mean, this idea of now I have to buy toothpaste, you know, or, you know, I mean, gas. You know, I mean, gas was what I charged to my father. I mean, I was so spoiled. And uh, so I had, I did, I was real immature. I came in when I was 23 years old. I didn't really learn how to work till I was 30. And I had a level of fear that I didn't even identify. So I had problems getting up in the morning. I had problems managing my money. I had gambling problems. I had anger issues uh, as a father, those sorts of things. One by one, they'd kind of come at me, and I'd try to take them on. And I was singularly unsuccessful at managing or at getting rid of my defects of character in my early sobriety. And at first, I thought, oh, I'm just not doing this right. I'll, I'll just jack it up a little bit. And I'm going to five meetings a week. I'm sponsored. I sponsor people. I'm starting to give talks. I do jail stuff. I'm doing institutional stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, this is just timing. I'll get it. You know, well, I didn't get it. Well, I can tell you by my fourth or fifth or sixth year of sobriety, when you still don't know how to work, you get an idea that something's wrong. Uh, you know, that you don't have a pass. You know, you're really going to have to get this thing handled. And if you don't get it handled, you're not going to have a very good life. Um, and I didn't have an answer. And what happened to me is I got more and more scared. And I kind of thought maybe this is just another deal where I do a great start and poor finish. You know, I've done that one a lot. Now I'm going to do an AA. You know, it works for other people. It doesn't work for me. And I really believe without a hesitation that it worked for you. Now, what I lost the belief in, believe it or not, was step two. I went back, so out of desperation, 
when I when my pants caught on fire at seven and seven between seven and eight years of sobriety, I'm thinking about suicide, really thinking about suicide, not just sort of thing. I'm not thinking about drinking, but I'm thinking about, you know, I don't want to go through this cycle again. And uh, the answer was, uh, you know, I've been, uh, Sandy and I have been exposed to some of the great teachers in AA. And I've, in my home group, I mean, one of them for me, one of my great teachers is Warren. And uh, there were other, other models for me. And those people all had a level of spirituality that I did not have. But the problem that I have with spirituality is if I was going to develop spirituality, I'm going to develop a relationship with God, right? Well, if you develop a relationship with God, you do not have to be a rocket scientist to figure out he's going to want you to get rid of your subscription to Penthouse. You know, I think. I'm not positive. Or stop your gambling habit that's four or five hours a day. You know, and maybe get on a budget. Maybe, you know, not stop spending 500 more bucks a month than you make. And, you know, stop being angry or violent with your children. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that you've got three or four patterns of behavior in your life that are probably going to get right on the line as soon as you open up the relationship. So I thought, what the hell is the use of, I've been trying to change those things for six years. What the hell is the use of developing a relationship with God if you can't fulfill the conditions of the relationship? So as soon as I clean my act up, I'll go put my application in. <laughs> but, but putting it in ahead of time, it, it just isn't going to work. And I was stuck in that place for two and a half years. And finally, out of desperation, I went back to the steps. Step one, real easy. You know what I was missing? Step two. I lost step two. I believed it for us, but not for me. Uh, you know, I, I mean, crazy. I believed it. Without question, I believed it for us. I could tell you that this program of Story to Sanity, when in fact I was living my life with a level of unmanageability, and I didn't believe it for me, and I had to regain that. And out of the pain, you know, pain, the touchstone of spiritual growth in Alcoholics Anonymous, pain got me to a second surrender. And my ego got suppressed enough that I finally got to a point and said, okay, it's all got to get up on the table. Let's put it on the table. I'll put anything on the table. I'll put my marriage on the table. I'll put my business on the table. I'll put it all on the table. And uh, I started to look around. And, of course, when I extricated my head from my backside, I made a discovery is that there were people in my own meeting with bigger problems than I had, with smiles on their faces, resolving those problems with the steps. And I came to believe again that God was going to restore me, not us, me, <laughs> even though us, to sanity. I did a third step on my knees with my sponsor in his office, and I went through and I did a fourth and fifth step. And after I did the fourth, it was my third, fourth, and fifth step. I'm seven years sober at this time. And after I did that, um, I had a relapse into my defects of character of some significance one day where, you know, uh, where I went to work late, left early, got in a backgammon game, won 600 bucks, came home, got in a fight with my wife, and slapped one of the kids. One of those days you'd like to have it videoed and sent to the general service office uh, <laughs> to show what eight years of sobriety can do. And uh, I said, gee, it happened again. And I'm saying, well, weren't you there? <laughs> I'm saying, yeah, but it was so habitual. It's like I'm in a blackout. So I'm not, I'm like out of relationship to my own life. I mean, that's how, that's how nuts it is. Okay. And what I realized in that moment of truth, when I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, when I took step one, I was stripped down and I stood naked in front of my alcoholism. At eight years of sobriety, I was stripped and stood naked in front of me out of the unmanageability of my life, out of the powerlessness of my life sober. And I realized that I couldn't do it, that on, on, on my own resources, I was insufficient to the process. And then I got a second thought I hadn't had in a hell of a long time. You are right where you're supposed to be. And I was allowed to take the sixth and the seventh step, which I had not taken at depth until I was eight years sober. You know, I was trying to get rid of my defect of character. I don't have the power to get rid of my defect of character. And in that surrender moment, okay, I took the sixth and the seventh step, and four of the major problems I was dealing with in my life disappeared that night. Okay. Now, I 
I had to put supports in. I talked to my sponsor and made appointments about when I'd go to work and how long I'd stay at work. I gave my wife the checkbook. I stopped gambling that night. So I, I had to do things that would help support that decision, which I often had not done in the past. So this pattern where fairly serious crap going on fairly long into sobriety, while it's an unattractive pattern and one that I'm not trying to advertise, I think it is not uncommon. I think it is that many of us end up in a plateau in early middle sobriety where we have fairly serious, un I think our alcoholism goes underground. The physical part gets cured and the alcoholism starts to express itself in compulsive and obsessive behavior in some other area of our life, sexually, eating, money, you know, whatever, the, wherever the hell it comes out. I was a generalist. I had two or three. There are some people who, <laughs> some people specialize, you know, they just have one. And, uh, but I don't, very few people are exempt from what I just described. And that, you're, and that the pattern of your alcoholism goes underground and, ex and continues to express itself in your sobriety, in your life. And I'll tell you something. Those patterns of compulsion in my life, it was like drinking. It was like being on dry drunks. I had blackout-like moments. I, had, I was hiding stuff. I had patterns of behavior that were very familiar to me in my sobriety. And, uh, but when I took, when I, when I went in order through the steps and got to step six and seven and had started to have a second spiritual surrender. But the only reason I had that surrender, I think, is because I went through the steps. I had, the only reason I was able to do six and seven at that depth is I had the first five alive and well at that moment. And I was in as much pain. But I told Warren, I said, I feel like I'm dying of thirst lying next to a lake. I said, I can pass the test. I know what to do. I just can't do it. <laughs> I know what to do. I, I'm not doing it. And uh, I'll tell you something. Uh, I think that a lot of us, uh, when I said we are not under-equipped, I see people in Alcoholics Anonymous that I think are enormously talented people and whose lives do not seem to reflect that talent. And the, if I were to put it two places, one is I would, I would say it's a, it's a type of when you have unresolved problems, they are like miniature black holes. They suck the joy out of your life. They just drain you of energy that you need to live your life. And I think it's the irresol irresolution of those things that drain us of that spirit that Sandy was talking about. When he said, I get to share the spirit. Well, he gets to share it because he's open. His pipe's unclogged. Okay, But I think, you know, certainly at seven years of sobriety, I had a little log jam in front of my pipe. There was no spirit coming out. There was a little pus leaking out the end of the pipe, but <laughs> there was no, no great spirit, you know, coming out of it. And uh, uh, so what I want to say is I don't think that's as unusual as I, th I thought it was unusual. I thought it was dirty. I was, I was ashamed, and I did not want to share it. My sponsor knew about 60% of what was going on. I know that over here you tell 100%, and I think that's terrific that you, <laughs> that you do that. I was only telling myself 60%, by the way. <laughs> so that's why my sponsor only had 60% of it. I wasn't strong enough to give myself the right truths and the, and, the, and the level of honesty. Okay, But when I put it all on the line, and I, you know, what happens to you is you die. What do you got to do? All you got to do is die and change everything. Other than that, there's not much left to do. But, but you know, I, I know that one of the things that holds us back from really in a... In a open and willing way, offering ourselves to the God our understanding is we think we're going to disappear. I mean, you take away my defects of character and you take away, you know, some of those things in my life. Where am I in that process? Okay, well, I'll tell you something. You're going to be more there than you have ever been in a real and substantial way. You're going to have a chance to be in your life in a more powerful way than you've ever been. It is the opposite because you have now freed yourself of what's been holding you back. You have had, you know, all these layers of crud. You know, all these years you thought you were the Chevrolet. You've been putting new tires on it. You've been putting new hubcaps on it. You've had that some bitch painted eight times. You've got, you know, you're dragging up and down. You're the driver. And you've paid almost no attention to the driver. And so when we get out of the external solution, when we get out of 
painting the car and putting new hubcaps on it. When we get out of it, as soon as I get the next 50 grand, as soon as I get the next this, as soon as I get the right woman or man, as soon as I get a new breast job, as soon as I get, I, I happen to have a very good one, and uh, <laughs> uh, you probably haven't noticed. Uh, but uh, uh, but most of us, uh, without even realizing it, are externally oriented. We're looking outside of ourselves for the answer, and we don't expect. And it's just the opposite. It is just when you find when you start to find the answer inside is when you really can start start expressing your life. So what I want to say is that I don't think it's uncommon to get stuck. I think the nature of spiritual walk. What do they always say? The greatest temptation once you have found God is to be tempted with the removal of God. The dry periods are the toughest periods of time you will have. Maintaining a lifetime relationship with Alcoholics Anonymous is not easy. Maintaining a lifetime relationship with your sponsor is not easy, or a spouse. That is what life is about. It will put you in front of you. Long-term relationships will put you in front of the unworkability of your life. If you are going to be a 40-year member of AA, you're going to have to resolve relationship issues and life issues of some significance quite a number of times to remain vital, active, and important uh, and, and keep your program alive. Uh, so the unworkability is not uncommon. There is a solution, even though it looks like it's proving to you in the middle of your sobriety that it doesn't work. It is the opposite. What I found in retrospect, what was happening to me is that my nose was being pushed in something more real that there was a pile of manure, that I, my nose was being pushed in it, and I was, rather than my life getting worse, I was simply seeing it as it was. I did not see it as it was at one year of sobriety. I did not see the causes and conditions. I did not see the level of unmanageability. And, and through the work and the steps, it was like God's hand was at my back, pushing me a little bit closer to the reality of my life, and it felt like it was going backwards. It was the opposite. It was going forwards. I was moving towards what was in my way. And I think a spiritual journey, and, and well, you know what? What's in your way is an illusion. The path of spiritual growth is through the fire, not around it. The fire is an illusion. Everyone in this room knows that when they've changed a significant piece of unworkability in their life, it produced energy, not pain. It was an experience of joy, not pain. And why we resist, because we think we're giving something up and it's painful when we get close to seeing the truth. So I think our walk in Alcoholics Anonymous is that walk. And we're, we're going to run into periods where it's going to be easier than other periods. And we're going to run into periods where it seems like it doesn't work. And that's the nature of, spiritual, that's the nature of a spiritual journey. And... Uh, Thanks, Bob. I enjoyed that immensely. Um, what I want to talk about is going back to basics. But before I forget it, because these, I get these ideas that go in my head, I want to just make an aside about a phrase that we hear that I've been thinking about lately. Things happening in God's time. Has anybody ever heard that thing? Well, it's just happening in God's time. And um, this is what I think about that. I think that's crazy. <laughs> Let's say that um, you haven't had a job in a while, and you're running out of money, and you're panicking over it. It's, you're freaking out. You can't sleep. I mean, it's just got you. So you go to your higher power, and you decide to pray about it. And you pray, God, please find me a job. Please help me find a job so that I can systematically save a little bit out of my paycheck and allow this money to build up so that it will take away this terrible panic that I have over this situation. The prayer is asking for something that takes a long time. 
We just prayed that our problem be solved in about a year. Instead of saying, God, could you please remove my fear over my situation now? And we get it now. So in other words, the time frame that we established is what we got. And then we blame it on God. Well, it's just happening in God's time. Oh, no, that's exactly what you asked for. So I'd like a job, and then I'd save up the money, and then I'll do that. And then, because in our own mind, we think we see a solution, which is an intellectual solution instead of a spiritual solution. The spiritual solution is the closeness to the higher power where there are no problems. You see, they just get lifted out. When it's lifted out and the fear is gone, your creativity rushes back and you suddenly dream up a perfect place to go look for a job that you wouldn't have been able to think of while you're in a panic state. I mean, it is, it is so funny. So I'm throwing that out. Now, I'm sure there is such a thing as God's time, but I, I, I'm saying a lot of times we set the stage for something that's going to unfold. <laughs> over a long period of time, and we're impatient. Well, we're getting exactly what we asked for. And so I just saw that out of something. Now, the thing about the basics, um, there, was a, there was a story about um, people visiting a friend of theirs in the hospital who was in an oxygen tent, and they're carrying on a conversation through the plastic. You know, how's it going, Joe? Oh, doing good. I'm feeling good. Yeah, it looks like I might be getting out in a couple of days in there. Hey, can I get you something? No, no, I'm fine. Well, go help yourself to a banana. And they're, they're having this thing. And when the guy comes back with the banana, he's eating it, he steps on the oxygen hose. And as they're visiting, Joe is displaying some symptoms of... Uh, <laughs> not doing too well and he's getting a <laughs> shortness of breath and it's you know so they buzz the nurse and she comes in and goes oh my god maybe it's his heart maybe I, let's take his blood pressure. and they're thinking maybe we got to get him some insulin maybe, i don't know get the doctor have you done his medication and then somebody looks and goes you're stepping on his oxygen hose they step off and everything's straightened out but for a while there was a complete misdiagnosis of the situation. And I think that it, we can easily misdiagnose our problems as they occur to us. And so I like to think about what is our problem. Did you ever, now, before we come to AA, we were told about that all the time. How many of you remember... <laughs> What was their favorite thing that people would point at? You know what your problem is? You're a lazy son of a... You know what your problem is? And we were being told all the time what our problem was. When we came to AA, they tell us again. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But where did they get this? Where did they get this? This is what your problem is. And I like to think that, you know, what is alcoholism? Maybe we should all agree on what it is, uh, because there's many definitions, the American Medical Association, all kinds of things, and I'm sure if we went around the room, everybody here would have a definite, oh, I can't drink safely. It's an obsession of this and a compulsion of the mind and an allergy of the boop and a beep, and they have all of those <laughs> things that we could use as a definition. But here's where I like to go to establish, you see, because if you're going back to the basics, that is... The basic, right, is an agreement of what the problem is. And if uh, I like to get um, Carl Jung back involved when he sent Roland off. Now, the, the ending to that story, and Bob knows it very well, is that um, after AA had been around for a number of years, as a matter of fact, it was uh, just about up into the six, 1960, Bill Wilson realized that he had never given Carl Jung the credit that he deserved because he really had established um, the fundamentals of the surrender into AA with Roland. And so he wrote him a letter. And every, every so often they'll have this exchange of letters between Dr. Young and Bill Wilson in the grapevine. If you ever see him, you ought to read him. And Bill just wrote to tell him that um, Maybe you don't remember, but Roland Hazard, you treated him, and as a result of what you told him, he went here. And then 
he came and we started this organization. It's now all over the world. It's Alcoholics Anonymous. And you played the key starting role in getting this all done. And then Dr. Young wrote back, and it was right before he died. It was amazing that Bill happened to write him. And I think six months later, uh, he had died. And he wrote back and said, Dear Mr. Wilson, uh, no, I didn't know what happened to um, Roland. I'm so glad to hear that. That is absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you for sharing that. He said, Now, when I was seeing um, Roland Hazard, it was so early in the century, I knew that spirituality was the answer to this, but it wasn't safe for me as a psychiatrist to talk about that because I would have been laughed out of my profession. But now... Well, many psychiatrists are seeing that there are spiritual powers and that this is a important component of human beings. And um, he said, this is what I felt about alcoholics back then. And he went on to describe the situation of being an alcoholic as having a thirst for something beyond ourselves. And the implication is that alcoholics have an extraordinary longing for God. They all sense that something's missing in their lives and they are constantly aware of this emptiness and they search for something to fill this, not knowing what it is. This is called misdiagnosis. We think it's money or sex or power or whatever it is. And we find out what it is through the process of elimination. Money doesn't fix it. This doesn't fix it. This doesn't fix it. We show up at this hokey pokey program <laughs> that says, oh, we know how to fix that thing. Do you know that thing inside of you? You know that thing? That's because you're too far away from God. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, lo and behold, that does fix it. Now, there is the core of the problem. So we always have to remember that no matter how, what we're diagnosing as our problem today, we're misdiagnosing. This is the core problem. So when we go into the big book, and it, what does it say our dilemma is? Lack of power. Now, do we always diagnose it that way? Oh, I just got fired. My kid ran away. I don't know where the heck he is. Oh, my God, what are these feelings that I'm having? It's hard to go. It, oh, this is lack of power. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Because our mind just is, is quickly interpreting and going, oh, no, I, I, I need more money, and I have to go find my son, and I have to do that. That's why I am so upset. No, that, that is not why you're upset. My friend Hal Marley says, misery is optional. <laughs> so if we, are, if we are troubled, it's because we have a circumstance which is neutral, that is bothering us. That's the problem, not the circumstance. See, the guy next door has the same circumstance, but his spiritual condition is such that it's not troubling him. It is just a circumstance. Oh, I lost my car. Oh, I'll find it tomorrow. You know, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's not a major event. He just, well, I'll notify the police. And the guy over here is loose. He can hardly breathe. My car, my car, my car's coming. They both had the same circumstance. This guy is not being troubled by it. This guy is being troubled by the circumstance. What's his problem? Lack of power. If you will go to... The power doesn't make you find your car. The power gets you undisturbed. And the problem wasn't the car missing. The problem was that it bothered you that it was missing. You see the difference? It is, it is a very core issue. And so as we go... Even in the beginning, of course, we can't even conceptualize this. I'm sure there's people sitting out here now going, What? What's he, what do you think? <laughs> But you can't have a life without, prop, without circumstantial issues and problems. Yeah. I mean, it's unavailable. If we think the solution is going to be that we're going to get to a point where we just aren't going to have problems. No, it'll never happen. No, it'll never happen. But we have to, that's why we have friends. That's why we go to meetings. 
That's why we go in there and we just go, and then you just go, well, we have to surrender. We have to, we're going to get this and we can get undisturbed again and then move into the situations and resolve them on the other level. Now, this is it brought out beautifully. It's my favorite thing to talk about in the fundamental nature of the problem in the chapter of the agnostic. And I think I do this every time I talk. I go to those first two paragraphs in the chapter of the agnostic. And it says, okay, are you new? Let me explain spirituality to you. Says, I'm going to explain. It's very simple. It's a real easy thing. It's not like religion where we tell you about a certain higher power who was born 4,000 years ago. This is our best guess of what he looked like. And uh, this was over in India. And then and he left these messages and blah, blah, blah. And so you believe what I'm saying, then trust this power and you're going to be fine. We don't have an AA power. There's no such thing. So, and spirituality doesn't have a power. It has a path. It has a technique to get in touch and then you can describe what this power is. So they lay it out. Now, so how do you get spiritual then if there's nothing to believe in? You know, see what I'm saying? How, well, how do you do this? Well, you go to the problem as it's laid out in that chapter. And it says very simply, and see if you can follow this. Now, if when you drink, you have little control over the amount you drink, everybody. <laughs> if when you stop, you can't stay stopped, everybody. <laughs> then you're an alcoholic. Okay, so there it is. Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. Okay, now let me tell you what that means when you just said you're an alcoholic. If that's the case, you are suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience can conquer. And you go, what? I remember my sponsor talking to me, and he says, did you hear what I said? You're suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience. It's one of the rare illnesses in the American Medical Association <laughs> that only a spiritual experience can conquer. And I said, Bill, I don't believe in spiritual experiences. Oh, you're screwed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, what am I going to do? Why don't you change your mind? <laughs> Become a former agnostic. Become the top. And then I'm going, spiritual experience, what is that? You know, I'm going to believe in the power. What is that? And I had the same feeling Bob does. I don't want to get spiritual to make me give all my crap away to the poor. <laughs> what if it overtakes you and your mother Teresa and, and she doesn't go bowling or anything? And so I don't want that. You know, I don't want to become entirely spiritual, and I want to partial. Whoa! So then the next paragraph confronts this. Okay, you're almost spiritual. You're almost there. It says to be doomed an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not easy alternatives to face. That's a Jack Benny punchline right there. That is a comedy line. Do you understand it? Okay, you're on the quiz program. You're called up. Okay, Mary, you've got to choose one of these doors, door A or door B. Die an alcoholic death, live on a spiritual basis. And guess what? Wow. Whoa, 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 whoa. Is there another door? Oh. Doctor, how bad is this, uh, an alcoholic death? Oh. Okay, I'll do the spiritual door. Why do we get spiritual? There's nowhere else to go. They made us a deal we couldn't refuse. We didn't believe in it. We believed that there had to be something behind that door or it's over. So A doesn't try to prove the existence of a higher power, but it sure convinces you of the need for one. And when you accept to the, your core gut that you need a higher power, you're 95% there. That's what the way I feel. I, you, the game is almost over. We just have the other 11 steps. <laughs> but there, but, but there's, you see, but that's not, that's hardly anything. The steps are very easy. It's debating whether you're going to do them. That is the hard part. How long does it take to do a four step? Oh, Four years and three hours. Four years of delaying and three hours of doing it. 
But if we desperately have to get through it all, these things go bing, 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 bing. Just, you can just go, go through because we're eager to get there. Why are we eager to get there? Are we convinced there's a pot of gold at the end? No. We're convinced that what will happen if we don't do it. And then when we get there, we go, oh, my God, I had no idea I was going to get this jackpot. And then when we tell our stories, it doesn't sound like that. We go, well, I came in. I saw this beautiful spiritual program. (laughs) And I just went for it. (laughs) And then your sponsor goes, yeah, with my hands around your neck choking you. You eagerly sought the spiritual program. So what I'm just covering there is don't misdiagnose anything. Um, The last thing I'll turn back to Bob is I, I don't think I've missed more than four days without going to a meeting. And I'll tell you why I don't want to ever do that. Because I've heard stories about guys with gals with solid, solid programs. And they moved. And while, when they first moved, there was a screw up and the house heating system wasn't working and the, this thing and their job sent them over here and then they got sick. And through no real deliberate action on their part, they went maybe a month without meetings. And here comes the tricky part. And they felt even better than when they were going to meetings. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not handle that. You put that in my computer, that I'm, when, uh, I feel better after a month without meetings than I did with 25 years with meetings, I would not know how to handle that. Where, does, where do you file that? You see what I'm saying? Wow, maybe I overreacted. <laughs> you were pretty young. Yeah, I was young, you know. <laughs> Maybe in 25 years they've taken the impurities out of booze that, that, that hurts you. And... <laughs> Maybe I didn't need those meetings all the time. Maybe I was brainwashed. Maybe I'm doing great. It's, I can't believe that. I don't know how to handle that. So I never want to have that situation. So I'm just going to keep going and going so that I never have to deal with that. Okay. Enough out of me. Back in here. The problem is that you say things so well, it doesn't need anything added to it. I mean, it really, I mean, think of that. I mean, think of how well he just, you know, went back to something that I have read three or four times in the last, in the last three or four months. And, uh, <coughs> but drew it to my attention in a stronger way than it was when I read it. Uh, And again, that's the nature of a spiritual book, is that when you really bring your attention to it, it is new. I mean, I I think most of us heard that new, not like, you know, the first two paragraphs of the chapter to the agnostic. And isn't that, I mean, there is nothing in our society that would support what Sandy said. I mean, there's not much. I mean, the, the other thing is what, what you need is, you know, younger women, faster horses, and more money, or whatever that song was. You know, I mean, that's what you need. That's where your answer is. There's a guy, but there's a book I was reading by Eckhart Tolle called The Power of Now. One of the distinctions he makes is the difference between happiness. He says happiness is a condition that is based on your perception that circumstances are okay. So most of us are, are thinking that, what, what do you want? I want to be happy. But peace and joy are not conditioned upon circumstances being okay. You can have peace and joy and have trouble. Okay? Most of us identify the trouble with ourselves. We think we're the problem, that something's wrong with my life, not my life circumstances. And it's really tough to change your life, you know, it, it it isn't so tough to get on a budget, but it's tough to change who you think you are. And I think that many of us have these distinctions collapsed. And what we're trying to do is kind of change our essential selves. 
But Sandy, part of, part of what Sandy was saying is when you access the power, the problem just becomes circumstances. You are now able to be in front of those circumstances. I, for the longest time, had an issue of being angry and sometimes occasionally violent with my middle boy. Uh, he was just a pain in the ass. He was just a challenge to me. He just, uh, and it wasn't like there weren't issues. You know, he would occasionally get arrested or get thrown out of school or something like that. And my attitude was, what are you going to do? I mean, well, what the heck are you going to do? I don't know what to do. And I was doing what my dad did with me my, and my wonderful, wonderful man, my father. But I was doing what my dad did with me. It wasn't working, but, it, you know, it's a family thing. And... Um, uh, and somewhere into the unworkability of that, I got the thought that Sandy talked about with his neighbor. If my brother was parenting my son, my brother would not be doing what I am doing. If there were ten men who had my son as their son, only two of us would have struck him. Where is the problem? Okay. The problem is not in the circumstance. The problem is in my reaction to the circumstance. Life is just full of circumstances. And I'll tell you something else about circumstances and problems. I don't think about problems being opportunities. How is God going to get our attention if something wants to change? How is the universe going to get our attention if it wants us, if it wants to get the message to us? And the message is, it's not working. Okay. Pain. Or your spouse. Or your father. Or your son. It's going to come from the people in your life. Maybe your creditors, maybe a cop, but depending upon how integrated your life is. That is the universe giving you evidence of the workability and unworkability of your life. And it is a signal to pay attention. And you can change, make decisions, start to do something different. And and we take it as, you know... Why am I getting this message? Which, something's wrong. We, we panic when we do this. And I really think that it, what it is is guideposts. You know when they say, what do I do to, to become enlightened? Chop wood and carry water. What it means is live your life. As you live your life, you will be presented with the material you need to become spiritually awake. As you live your life with your spouse, you will be presented with the unworkability of yourself in relationships. You, or with your father, or with your mother, or with your son, or with your boss. When you live your life in long-term relationships, you will be presented with what needs to be dealt with for you to become spiritually awake. And then you bring it back into the process, you know, you bring it back into our practice. And as Andy says, once you start to believe that your resolution is in finding the power, the circumstances don't, it, it isn't personal. That's the thing that is just so profound to me over a period of time. Your life isn't personal. It isn't, it's, it's almost like it's not about you. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, that sounds nuts, but I mean, there's a freedom in that. The biggest freedom I've been able to maintain in my uh, access in my life, and I don't even know if this relates to what the heck we're talking about, but I am a reactor. Uh, you know, that spring-loaded, 60 miles an hour head first type thing, I would get a thought and I would react. And the thought, when I would have it, would be printed on my eyeball. When a thought is printed on your eyeball, it is your reality. There is no other place to look. Okay? So I would think, what else can you do? You know, I mean, I get it and I'd act on it. Okay? After a period of time, as you start to access, you know, the first three steps, you start to rely on the God of your understanding when you start to get out of your way and you start to realize that your thoughts are not reality. There's something wrong with the pattern. I mean, one of the things, one of the great conversations we have in Alcoholics Anonymous is you have to have a healthy questioning of your own thinking. Not a neurotic questioning, but a healthy questioning of what goes through your mind. It is, you know, that's, you know, our thinkers are not, you know, uh, always in tune. And so when you have that thought, I now have a space between my thought and when I act. I have a choice. I didn't, I think I've always had that choice, but it didn't appear to me that I had that space nor that choice. So I get a, I get, and, and at 37 years of sobriety, I get the same 
thought when I'm angry. I might have a thought to strike someone. But I look at that today and I think, wow, I haven't had that thought in two months. Where the heck did that come from? I haven't had that thought in a year and a half. Where the hell did that come from? I am not my thought. I'm no longer a monkey on a string. I'm not a jukebox. You can put a coin in me and push B5. I don't have to play B5. I used to have to play it. You put me in front of the circumstance, we're going to dance, baby. You want to dance? We'll dance. Okay? But now you put the coin in, you push the button, and I have to. I get to choose. That is like being let out of jail. Without any circumstance in my life being changed, I get to be at peace. In the circumstances, I get to be untroubled, as our book talks about. That is the priority. And therein lies, there is a significant part of the practice and solution. Good job, buddy. Folks, we're uh, getting down to the... Getting down to the final hour, and uh, before I get started, I want to thank you all. I mean, I've really had a good time. I've seen a lot of friends I haven't seen in a while, and it's been a great pleasure uh, for me. And I enjoy this. Like I said earlier, it's nothing like handing out good news. And that's all this is, is to just tell everybody. There used to be a radio commentator named H.V. Kaltenborn, and he used to start his program, There's Bad News Tonight. <laughs> and I like to start ours there's good news tonight all we got here is good news and um, so continuing um, my favorite prayer is the St. Francis prayer and um, St. Francis is, was quite a character because he was kind of like us a little bit. He was like a crusader with the swords and going off and whacking all the Muslims' heads off and just raising heck all over the Middle East and uh, in the name of God. And uh, he just saw that he didn't want to do that anymore. And he started really thinking about what would spirituality be? What, how, how, how do you do it? And he came to the conclusion that you must try to totally eliminate your ego. And that's what he spent his life doing, was trying to find one more thing where his ego was demanding something. You know, so he would sleep outside and he would give away his possessions and do various things. Not to be a nice person, but to keep reducing the ego so that the channel between his spiritual energy inside could open and he could feel nothing. He would be closer and closer to the pure energy. And as he did that, people liked to be near him just to feel the energy, just to feel that. And so his very being brought joy wherever he went. And that's the main attraction about St. Francis. And you see the birds and the animals, and they're all, they just want to hang around <laughs> that energy. And, of course, that's the energy of our higher power. So the real joy of the whole thing was just go hang around your higher power. I mean, that's what it's about. But you can't go there because your ego doesn't want you to. So the steps are designed to crash all the blockages between us and this flow of energy. St. Francis called it the channel. Help me to open the channel of thy peace. I used to think that the peace was God's peace out here, and if I could get my character defects and do all the steps and open this up, then this peace would come in, and I'd just be overcome by this wonderful feeling. That's exactly backwards. The peace comes out from me. It can finally, I can see that, that I was born with that. It's been in there all along. Part of the suffering that we do is that the real us wants to love everybody we see. The real us wants to just help other people. But our ego is going, don't fall for that junk. <laughs> you got to get out and get yours. You got to get out and do that. And our real self is crying. 
It's go- Why are you doing that? That's not who I am. Let me out of here. Let me show you who I am. So your ideas about yourself are totally wrong. You are a magnificent creature who is being blocked by a bunch of ideas that are wrong. Old ideas availed us nothing. So we go and get them the heck out of there. And we learn in the um, fourth and fifth step that it's impossible to see the truth about ourselves alone. That's why we go to another human being and we get to see the fourth dimension of our um, four-step inventory, which our third dimension. It's just sitting there. How do you know anything you wrote down is right? Since you rationalize all the time, that list is probably nothing. (laughs) So when you self-evaluate, you can only do it in two dimensions. So we need always another person. Don't forget the line. People of very high spiritual um, development always insist on checking with others the guidance they feel they've gotten getting from God. So high development, and they still check with somebody else. Check with somebody else. How many times we go to our sponsor with this problem? They're after me. They're going to get me the good. And then he goes, "Wait, wait. There's this. There's that. There's this. There's that." And then you say, "Well, if you look at it that way, <laughs> it's a different thing." This is what power is. It's the power to see it differently. When we see it differently, it ch- it changes everything. So, when we, there, I read a book where the author said that, you know what the planet Earth is? It's a soul school. That's what it is. That's why it's here. You got a whole bunch of souls, and they're going to school down here. So every, um, and we come in here, and now we're really in a soul school. And in order to get through the school, there have to be quizzes. And there has to be exams. And there have to be things. And so, we go, okay, now we're in soul school. We're going to show you how to use the power of this wonderful program to get through grief. Wouldn't you like to be able to do that with grace and dignity? Okay, well, then we've got to kill somebody in your family. <laughs> now, see, I'm, I'm, I'm making a joke, but I'm saying these events have to happen. So now your mother dies. Now we're going to have to deal with grief. This is the saddest thing. This is oh, what would the program have us do? Wow, my mother died, and I've got ten years in the program. Why don't I try to show the new women in our group how to go through this with grace and dignity, so that when their mother dies, they won't be as afraid of it, and they won't be as fra- frightened of the future. I've been given a very noble challenge here, so I will experience my grief but I will also experience something bigger than that. Oh, what a new way of looking at it. You see the difference? It, it, it just takes every challenge that comes along, and if we can get other people to help us see it, see it as having a purpose. It's not to destroy you. It is to destroy more of our ego. It is to have us come out the other side a different person. And so that's the way I look at Um, all the early steps um, are opening the channel. Opening the channel so this power can flow through. And we have to clear up the wreckage of the past. And then um, when it comes back to me, I want to make a comment about six. But what I wanted to get to now is I talked about the promises earlier and the verbs and the promises. At the end of the ninth step, you know, it's all these abstract, verbs that are only spiritual verbs. You couldn't get that from figuring anything out. It is just a gift that's just handed to you. Peace is handed to you. A way of seeing things. Um, Suddenly life takes on a real meaning. How? How? Hey, don't worry about how. It just happens. just happens. You're doing these stupid steps that you don't believe in, and all these things are just happening because a power is causing them to happen in you. And in the uh, big book, It's an interesting sentence um, right after the promises. It says, now we're at step 10. And it's um, about the fourth sentence down. It says, we have entered the world of the spirit. And, And we saw that we entered it when we saw the promises. 
See, the promises are using verbs that describe the world of the Spirit. So after the first nine steps, now we're going to enter the world of the Spirit, and that world exists in 10, 11, and 12. This is the world of the Spirit. So where is the world of the Spirit? You know what I mean? Is it um, another planet? Is it uh, over there? When you go to India, up in the Himalayas? I mean, where's the world of the Spirit? And we find out the world of the Spirit is in the now, which is exactly what Bob was talking about in the book that he was kind enough to get me a copy of. The, the, the Spirit only exists in the now. There's no other place to find it. So anytime we're worried about the past or frightened about the future, we're cut off from the Spirit. So the whole 10th step and, and, and 11 and 12, passing the message on and practicing principles in all our affairs, you look at the 12th step, it lists 100 different problems. You know what I'm saying? You remember the 12th step in the, in the, in the 12 and 12? It's just 100 different problems. And then this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen. Those are all spiritual quizzes. They're all little tests to show you the power that you now have access to. And it'll show, it just talks in there about, now when this happens, then you just get closer to your higher power, and it'll lift you out of that one. It'll give you a different way of looking at it. It'll always show you how these are designed to have you grow and not get destroyed. Your ego's getting destroyed, but you're being set free. So problems, our attitude towards problems or, or circumstances changes. And we, it says that in the seventh step, that our attitude towards pain changes. Because pain is just the ego being crushed some more and some more. And um, as we see the outcome... And the growth that comes out of every bit of that pain, Bill writes, our attitude about pain changes. And we suddenly see, it. oh boy, here, I'm going to be going somewhere. This is, and so it all of a sudden it becomes effort. It's kind of like when you're out of shape and you haven't worked out. When you first start, isn't it painful to go over and work out and the muscles are going and this and that? But what about three months later when you're in shape? You're still doing the same thing that was so painful. Now you're over there going, God, this feels so good, and it's, it's energizing me, and I'm doing this. So your whole attitude about pain has changed because you see the results that are coming. Before we got to AA, we were going to the gutter, and every bit of pain was driving us down, and now every bit of pain is guiding us up. The, 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 the course of spirituality is like a beam. When I was taught flying, and I think Creighton, the same thing, the only navigation they had was the radio range. You remember the radio range, Creighton? There was no needle. You didn't have anything in there to tell you. You had to listen and pick up this beam, and then if you were off the beam to the right, you heard an A, you know, dit da, and then if you went off to the left, you heard an N, dot, dit, whichever they are. And so if you ever, got on a radio beam, and heard nothing but a solid beam, you knew there was something wrong. Nobody can fly that beam with wind and altitude and planes and the just erratic equipment and everything without constantly going off it. And then that told you to get right back on it. So in order to get communicated to that you are on the right path, you had to get a signal that you're going off. Now, in our spiritual life, we call that pain. It's to get, if we never, if we just sat in oblivion the whole time, we couldn't believe that it was real. And so the pain that comes into our lives are these corrections so that we can continue to grow from it. So it's built in. It's the way it's supposed to be is to experience these discomforts along the way. So if you're experiencing them, you're not doing anything at all wrong. It's the way it was set up. This is how God set the radio range up so that you will be able to follow his guidance to this freedom that is out in front of you. And um, it is simply a matter of maintaining that. And so that's what this step is talking about. The essence of the last three steps, in my judgment, is staying undisturbed. That's what the whole deal is, staying undisturbed. Because when you're undisturbed, you're in the now. When you're undisturbed, you have conscious contact. 
So all we got to do when we feel ourselves getting disturbed is to go, time out. There's four little things in the 10th step. Just stop and say, I'm getting disturbed. But we don't like to promptly admit that there's something wrong with us. You know what I'm saying? We don't like to go, oh, I'm off course. I'm starting to go a little bit off course. We like to pretend we're still on course and we'll stay in that pain for a month. You know how far off course you can get in a month? It takes forever to get back on the AA beam because we didn't want to admit we were going off it in the first place. Oh, no, I don't go off the beam. I'm, I've got the program. I've been sober 20 years. I just mm, fly right straight ahead. That's what it's saying. When we're disturbed, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with us. What is, what's wrong with us? You're disturbed. That's it. That's what's wrong with you. And so all you have to do is change your, prior, change your priorities to my new goal is to always get undisturbed. I'm going to pray to not get as disturbed in the first place, but then my new goal is I get disturbed, I'm going to get undisturbed. So in other words, you're going down the field. It's almost like we have a referee. You're going through your day. Oh, it's disturbed. You can't go forward until you get undisturbed. (laughs) Time out. Time out. You can't move the ball any further until you get undisturbed. Why? We don't want you moving down the field disturbed. You're going to throw the ball at the referee. You're going to do this. Now you're going to have to make amends. Now it's going to take forever to clean the thing up. So when somebody comes into your office and and your boss comes up to you and says, you know this memo you wrote last night? It sucks. You're disturbed. (laughs) If we don't go time out, we're liable to say, hey, (laughs) take this job and shove it. And as those words are leaving our mouth, we're trying to get them back. (laughs) We need this job. And he goes, oh, too late. Out of here. <laughs> so we got to go, oh, disturbed. <clears throat> Get on the phone. Call up. I call up my friend Dan. I go, Dan, let me run something by you. This is my favorite thing to do. See, the longer you're sober, the quicker you pick up the phone. Newcomers take forever to pick up the phone. <laughs> when you were around a long time, you just, oh, I'm getting a little tiny bit disturbed. Hey. Let me run something by you. I did that. that. The boss came in. He did that. And uh, he'll say one of two things. He will either say that other person is being totally outrageous. They're totally off the wall. Forgive them. Or they'll say, you're all screwed up. Go make an amend. The, The goal is once I finish, I'm back to being undisturbed. Now I can proceed through the day. Now, if you proceed through a day undisturbed, You are generating St. Francis-like energy. You follow what I'm talking about? You don't think of yourself as St. Francis, but you have the same center that he did. It's all the same. The same amount of wonderful, spiritual, loving energy is inside of everybody in the room. It's all put in there. It's exactly the same. It's just a question of getting the channel open wider so that it can go. And when it's disturbed, boom, it's gone. So let's compare a disturbed person and an undisturbed person through a couple of normal events during, during a day. The disturbed person walks into the dry cleaning on the way home to pick up his tuxedo for this very important wedding tomorrow morning and is told that it won't be back. Now, guess what that poor clerk is feeling when he has to tell Mr. X that his tuxedo... Isn't going, they are shaking in their boots. And when he finds out, he goes, do you know who the hell I am? Let me talk to your boss. And then she reacts in some horrible way, and he goes home, and everywhere he went that day, and over at the pharmacy, they didn't have something else. And then they went, well, take your business somewhere else. And, and he comes home, and he just goes, the world is filled with rotten, grumpy people. <laughs> That's all I ran into today was rotten, grumpy people. The same person, undisturbed, he has that channel open, goes into the dry cleaner. He says, I'm sorry your tuxedo isn't going to be ready. It's got a mess up in the truck or whatever, and it won't be until Monday. And he sits there and he goes, God, I'm glad I'm not this clerk. What a terrible message you'd have to give to somebody. Look, 
I'll wear a dark suit. It's not a big deal. It's just a freaking wedding. Relax. God, I love coming in here. Do you know what you did to their day? Have any idea what you did? They glow. They, and the same thing at the pharmacy. I'll be back Monday. So, yeah, relax. Jeez, you probably get a lot of people in here chewing your head off. Relax. It's just wonderful. As you go through the day, you get the feedback from that kind of energy, and you conclude as you're going to bed that night that the world is filled with wonderful people. And they're all wonderful because of you. And you created your own reality out of this reversal of energy and putting a priority on being undisturbed. And so that's sort of what that means to enter the world of the spirit. And we have to stay there. As Bob said, we have a daily reprieve. I did a routine one time where I said, let's stop working the program. And then I went back and took the promises and had them go in reverse. We will lose serenity and peace. We will, you know, and it just all gets taken away. In other words, none of that stuff is permanent. And so we just maintain this undisturbedness and developing the channel further is the whole realm of the spirit in 10, 11, and 12. Those are some thoughts that I had. I'll pass it on to Bob. Sandy talked about ego. There's a couple of things I want to read. As you grow up, you form a mental image of who you are based on personal and cultural conditioning. We may call this phantom self the ego. It consists of mind activity and can only be kept through constant thinking. The term ego means different things to different people, but when I use it here, it means the false self created by unconscious identification with the mind. It says there, he starts the book, but he says there is an eternal, ever-present one life behind the myriad forms of life that are subject to birth and death. Many people use the word God to describe it. I often use the word being. And I think when each of us get a sense that there is something beyond form that that we connect with, that we, that we call God. And he said, you can only know it when the mind is still. One of the things we've talked about when he talks about being undisturbed, in order to access the now, in order to access God, we talk about prayer and meditation in our program. Over a period of time, we have to become more still. We have to become, there have to be more of a silence in the center of our being because we have too much velocity in our minds. We have too much chatter that occupies us as we go through our, our daily business. And so part of the reason we talk about having the discipline of prayer and meditation is to offer ourselves a chance to step aside and to calm down and to quiet down. One of the things you notice when you step aside and you do that is how busy your mind is. You're not even aware of it until you step aside to try to be quiet. But that practice over a period of time is, it says you can only know it when your mind is still, when you are present, and when your attention is fully and intensely in the now. Being can be felt, felt, but it can never be understood mentally. A couple of people have said, I, you know, you guys are talking and I have trouble understanding. I like what you're saying. And the nature of spiritual material is, is you can't hold the ocean of the world in the teacup of your mind. It is not, it's pointing to God. You can't contain God. In words, you can point to God. But as the Master said, you know, when the Master points to the moon, all the idiot sees is the finger. The words are the pointer, not the item. It says to regain awareness of being, to abide in the state of a feeling realization is enlightenment. But enlightenment is really the, simply your natural state of felt oneness with being. It is a state of connectedness with something immeasurable, indestructible something that almost paradoxically is essentially you, yet is much greater than you. It is finding your true nature beyond name and form. I love, you know, I think if you've been in the program a while, you get kind of themes or ideas. And one of the things that has attracted, there's two things that have attracted my attention the last year a little bit. One of them is, in the third step, the word decision. I never paid as, as much attention to that word as I have in the last year. And the book talks about, you know, ask the guy if he wants to come over to your house and make a decision. I think sometimes we skip over that word. When Sandy talked about make a decision to believe in God. 
you know, I mean, what a thought. I mean, most of us are saying, I don't believe. Why don't you decide differently? And there's a real act of will kind of directing your attention to it. And one of the other words that has caught my attention in the 12 steps is a spiritual awakening. So when we're talking about, what are we talking about being in the now? And being present, being enlightened, being more aware, being more spiritual. Uh, I think what happens to us is, is, you, is you become more awakened. I think the analogy that most of us have been sleepwalking would not be an incorrect analogy. Most of us have been doing things in our lives that we are not very conscious to. Been hurting people, making decisions at a low level. Now, as you start to become, as you start to do the work, as you start to get sober, as you start to go through the steps and go to meetings, little by little, you start to hear something. You go, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I You know, you, someone says something in a meeting and you go, yeah, me, I, I had that experience. You know, and what's happening to you is part of you is waking up that wasn't conscious. And as you increase your consciousness, you start to see the world differently. What did, I mean, I love the word that Carl Jung said to Roland. What page is that on? Find that for me, will you? <laughs> uh, uh, when, he, when, when he said the central ideas of our lives are suddenly cast aside. The, the ideas and values that I had are, you know, and whenever the book talks use, using spiritual, uh, the result of a spiritual experience, you often see the word suddenly, almost at once. You know, I mean, the, the preface is the moment I made the decision to go through my life, I really felt, and one of my favorite things when we're, so what we're talking about is that if you, if you, if you use this practice, you are not the same person. We, one of the things we forget is we're not who we used to be. We're not the unthinking, unconscious person we used to be. Maybe we still do some of the same things, same Chevy. You know, we're driving the same car, same hubcaps. But there's an alteration. There's a, there's a raising of consciousness. And I like, one of my favorite passages is right after step 10 when Sandy was talking about, you know, we have entered the world of the spirit. But at the bottom of page 84, it says, and we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time, sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor if tempted. We'll recoil from it from a hot, as, that, as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally. And we find that this has been happened automatically. Yes. We will see that our new attitude towards liquor, gambling, sex, whatever, our new attitude towards liquor has been given to us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That's the miracle of it. We're not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It doesn't exist for us. We are neither cocky nor afraid. This is our experience. This is how we react as long as we are in fit spiritual condition. Drop another sentence, and it says, We are not cured of alcoholism. We're granted a daily reprieve conditioned on the, contingent upon the maintenance of our spiritual condition. We're not the same people when we are in connection. And, but the memory, we, we, sometimes I think we are too strongly connected to our past. When Sandy talked about being in the present, because our past gives our ego the identity. Without our past, who are we? So our story becomes ever important to us. Well, when you have that story, you've got some place life is not okay. You've got some place you have to go for it to be okay. So we've got an enormous amount of attention in the future where our salvation is going to be. As soon as I find the right woman, it's going to be okay. As soon as I make 50 grand, it's going to be okay. As soon as I get this, as soon as I get rid of that, as soon as I... So we're in the past, running towards the future, having almost no experience. I mean, today, now, is just something we have to pass through to get to where we have to get to for it to be okay. When the only peace... And the only place you can ever be is now. And right at this moment, I suspect for most of us, right now, it's all okay. For every person that's present and in this conversation, and if you like this conversation, the reason we're able to have it is because of you. This conversation is contingent upon pitching and catching. You know, there is, you can't say the same thing to a different group. There is something that we are doing together. We are creating that you're pulling out of us 
what is coming out of us. If we did this to another group, it would be a different conversation. So we are creating this together. But So our level of consciousness, as we wake up, we just be different. And when you are present in this moment, there's nothing wrong. Pain, when you talked about Helm, Helm saying misery is optional, okay? Suffering is optional. Suffering and pain have to do with one thing, rejection of what is. When something happens, we're just confident that it should not happen. Flat tire, tuxedo getting screwed up, not getting a check in the mail. We're just confident that that shouldn't happen. The person who is who has some spiritual development, who has advanced, it is the way it is. It just is the way it is. It isn't personal. It's just the way it is. And my job is to be with that. They told me when I came in, hey, there's two ways for you to be at peace. Get everything you want or change the way you react to whatever happens in your life. The second thing is not contingent upon anything. When you can be comfortable with whatever is happening around you, you can have peace regardless of the circumstances. And so when you say to yourself, all I really want to do is be happy, I've been changing that word. All I want to really do is be at peace. I just want to be here now. There's nothing wrong. Most of us, are we've had this busted sense inside of us, the sense of what Sandy talks about, this deep longing for God. It shows up as a sense of separation because the ego is the separator. Chuck used to talk about the, the ego is the sense of conscious separation from. And that is what makes you over there, me over here. But it makes me different, puts us in opposition, wants me to be right, you wrong, wants me to dominate, wants you to be dominated. That is the business of the ego. When our fundamental spiritual business is to be loving. This is a soul school. The subject is love. You want to know if your life's moving in the right direction? <clears throat> If it's moving towards love, it's moving in the right direction. So rather than happiness, rather than trying to keep assembling the circumstances of our life, what if we remain undisturbed? What if we just trusted that it is the way it is supposed to be? It's just the way it is. And became lovers of reality and allowed ourselves to simply be in that process. Because when we, right now, there's nothing wrong with us. Because we've had a busted sense, we've always had a sense that it's not okay and I am not okay. That busted sense came from the sense of separation. When we start taking the spiritual journey, we get reconnected. When we are reconnected, we are not separate. It is okay and I am okay. And then you can be in the present. You're not running from the past to some salvation in the future and never being in the now. And what I think that is, is a different sense of consciousness. It's a different, it's an elevated awareness. It is an elevated awakening. And as you are more awake, many of the things that you did that don't work in your life, you just no longer do. They just, you see through them. They don't work. Okay, two more little stories, and then we'll do questions. And you better have some. <laughs> Bob made me think of something. Um, a lot of us knew Dr. Paul. What a wonderful man. And Dr. Paul used to cause some controversy. People used to write in the central office, not about Dr. Alcoholic Addict, but about Acceptance is the key to everything. Acceptance is the key to everything. Now, when you, when you see that, you would go, what about the serenity prayer? There are things you accept, and then there are things that you change. And I have to need, get the wisdom to know the difference. So you don't accept everything. So Dr. Paul was wrong. <laughs> and that was the am I making my point that, that it's like you can't accept everything if the serenity prayer says no when things come along they're in two categories they're those you accept and those you change they're both right they're both right we have to accept everything 
in order to return to undisturbedness so that we can make any evaluation at all about the serenity prayer. So everything does have to be accepted because that's what happened. Then, from an undisturbed point of view, we can, in fact, decide if something needs to be changed. Now, if we're not disturbed... Then it's an action, not a reaction. Yeah. If we're not disturbed, we may just not change it. (laughs) Because what was driving us to want to change it in the first place? Something happened that... Now, there's going to be categories of things where you would, absolutely calm as can be, decide to get a lawyer and sue somebody. But it wouldn't be, it would be because it was the right thing. You talked it over with people and they said, yeah, this is the right step to take. I'm using that. It could be many other things. But it's being done from a calm point of view and undisturbed. So if we're going to get the wisdom from our higher power, he can't communicate to us while we're disturbed because we can't hear him. There's too much noise. The still small voice can't get through the rage. <laughs> so you see that they're both right. I just I just wanted to make that point that um, acceptance is the key to everything. And from that, you can move into that. Now, the thing I was going to talk about was mercy, because you brought this up, and I just love it. You said, we don't want justice, we want mercy. <laughs> and I think mercy is, is a very powerful thing. And there's someone who needs a lot of mercy, and I'm going to ask you all to be especially merciful. And this person is you. It's you. Get off your back. Get off of it. Who the heck are you to be beating up you? You deserve the love from you. So let's, let me show you where the dilemma comes. And this is the last point I want to make. It's in the sixth step. And it's called the riddle of our existence. And it's going to get back to this coexistence in spiritual and material worlds. In the sixth step, where Tyler Red have God remove all these defects of character, we find out that the implication of that step is perfection. It doesn't say some of our character defects. It says all. Have you ever seen anybody with all their character defects gone? Nobody ever made it. Nobody ever made it. So, so what does that mean? See, Bill, Bill sees that this could create a mental problem. What do you put a step up there that can't be done? I mean, why would we have that step? And he goes and he goes to explain it. And and I'm going to try to see if I can get this clear. First, he says, we have to say to ourselves, well, what proof do we have that if I got entirely ready, God would remove entirely a character defect? He said, unfortunately, my friends, we have perfect proof. You're drinking. The biggest problem you ever had, you became entirely willing to have this problem removed, and it was removed after you humbly asked. So we already know that this principle works. If you get entirely willing, well, why don't we get entirely willing on all the rest of them? And Bill calls that the riddle of our existence. And he says the answer, the true answer may be only in the mind of God, but he speculates on what it might be. And what he speculates is that the rest of the character defects are not fatal like alcohol is. They're annoying. They are definitely blocking us from a closer contact with a higher power, and they are controlled by our ego. And so when someone comes up to us and says, okay, I've got the... See, everybody has the same character defects. They were issued to us at birth. So you didn't create any of them. So you can't take credit. Well, I uh, made myself lustful. No. You, we, we put that in when you came out to shoot. That's just part of the deal. <laughs> but we have the power here, and we know we just saw it with, with alcohol. And so here's your chance. That's really kind of ruining your life, right? Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm doing things. I'm embarrassed. And, you know, I don't know. 
Um, well, come here. We have a step for that. How would you like 100% of your lust removed? 100%. What would that be? What is that? Like you joined a nunnery? What is 100%? What I'd like is to be, I like 80% removed. That's what I, like. I might get lucky once in a while. And, All right, all right. So you want 80% with the lust. Okay, fine. Uh, What about greed? Stop wanting stuff and getting all this stuff. How about greed? You know, it made you cheat in business and it made you lie on your income. Would you like to get rid of all greed? Well, I would. um, Yeah, I'd like to get rid of most of the greed. I would really like to get rid of most greed. You see what we're saying? Most, most greed. Put me down for 70%. Greed. <laughs> well, how about gossip? Dr. Bob said gossip is one of the worst problems we have in Alcoholics Anonymous. Watch that erring member of the tongue. Gossip, gossip. Don't you see the harm it does? Yes, yeah, yeah, it does. I, I, I really hate gossip. I hate gossip. I would like to stop originating gossip. <laughs> Now, if somebody else originated it, and I'm just the conduit, it's technically not my gossip. I am, I'm simply reporting on... So I'd like to no longer originate gossip. And as we go through this step, we find nobody wants to write down all. And so, Why? This is the riddle. This is the problem. And it was, that's the way the system was set up. And it was set up because we're spiritual beings in a material world. And we have our instinctual drives, and no one's ever been able to ever get rid of all of them. And we have our quest to become closer to our higher power in opposition to the spiritual, uh, to the instinctual drives. That's our challenge, and we're never going to get there. If some, I forget exactly, it may be in the fourth step. It says, desires will always exist that oppose the grace of God. So what we have to do is accept that this is the deal, that this conflict is built into our system, and that we will strive towards perfection knowing we will never get there. So... You can't beat yourself up because there, it wasn't set up that you can become perfect. It wasn't set up that you're not going to screw up. And so get off your backs. You're doing the best that you can. And, and this is the, a very important point, or we have no fun in the journey. Because the journey is it. And if there wasn't this conflict, we wouldn't keep on going. And so we have to enjoy the fact that we're on the journey and we never get there. And as soon as you can get happy with the conflict, you have peace of mind. So I don't know if that made any sense, but I wanted to throw it out on the table. And going along with the mercy sort of thing, the lack of mercy means we're judgmental. Many of us are judgmental. We have the right answer. Some of us, and what happens if you're too judgmental, forgive me my trespasses as I forgive others, you turn the blade on yourself. In order to get deeper and deeper into what we have to take a look at in our lives, you need compassion, compassion for yourself. You have to be able to be gentle in the examination of your life, or you will not be up to examine it. You will suppress it and deny it and be not able to deal with it. You need a gentleness in that process, and I couldn't be more supportive of that. So now uh, I want to thank you. This has been a very nice experience to be with you. And uh, are there questions that we're going to? Oh, my God. (laughs) There's one. Yes. Oh, 
I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Okay. I know that you talked about assessments, okay, and also with assessments and expectations, you know, that we have the right people, or, you know, our type of place to see it. But, um, and then there's also attitude about all that. What, what are your views on that? Do you want to start, or do you want no, me to start? All right. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, it was suggested that with um, acceptance, we have to deal with expectations and that that causes a conflict because this is how other people are supposed to behave and they aren't behaving or, or whatever. And how does that tie in with acceptance? Um, I'm going, this is something that I have found very helpful. Somewhere we came up with the word fair. And we love to say that. And sometimes that has to do with expectations. We, I, you know, it wasn't fair what happened to me. It wasn't fair. I expect to be treated fairly. I expect, I expect. <laughs> this is a setup. <laughs> Here's a suggestion. Here's a spiritual rule. Fairness is a one-way street. It only goes out from me. End of fairness. My record, I want to be fair to everyone that I encounter. And then when I go to bed at night, I look at my side of the street, and I was fair, and I don't have any amends to make. If something happened and someone behaved in a certain way, maybe they're having a bad day. I don't know. It's none of my business. Their behavior is between them and their higher power. And I know that sounds like, wow, I mean, I'm just going to have to take all this. No, the only thing that takes it is our ego. Our spirit doesn't feel slights. <laughs> doesn't even know what a slight is. have not got a clue what a slight is. And so if we get slighted and feel it, we can just go directly to our higher power. Instead of saying, I want you to stop that because it's doing this, we can go directly, oh, you're forgiven, and go right to our higher power and go, can you take away that slight I just felt? Oh, I'll be glad to. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And so this gives us freedom from anybody else's behavior having to change so that we get happy. And so it's the, it's the ultimate solution. We are no longer dependent on anybody else doing anything and make fairness a one-way street. That's just the thoughts I have. You want to add anything? Okay. There's one for Bob. <laughs> okay. I didn't hear all of it. Can you repeat it when you hear it? The question is that we've both been around a long time. Is there anything that encourages us about our society of Alcoholics Anonymous or anything that discourages us about Alcoholics Anonymous? Um, I have an opinion on everything from hemorrhoids to brain surgery. Uh, <laughs> the... Uh, One of the things that, uh, uh, if there's anything that disturbs me uh, on, an, on a kind of an ongoing basis, it's the movement towards orthodoxy. And the, what I mean by the idea of judgmentality, if you're not doing it this way, you're wrong. We use the book like we used to think sometimes people use the Bible to judge and to see who's right on the right side of an issue rather than, I mean, of course, this is a, you know. But when I'm in a good place, uh, the program's of God. There is nothing wrong. I mean, it, we are still in rooms, eyeball to eyeball, sharing the spiritual principles, trying to encourage each other in our own lives to get on a path and do this. We want, where can you get in a room with 20 other people that generally want the best for you? They may not want to go on a fishing trip with you. We may not be that close, but almost never do you see in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that someone doesn't want what's good for you. What a wonderful place to go, and what a wonderful thing to have a practice. I think that Alcoholics Anonymous is a place 
where the proximity of God and practicality are, are clo- I don't know where you can get the access to spirituality and practicality with the mixture that we have because of our tradition or sharing our experience, strength, and hope rather than our ideology. The stricture of, pra- of sharing our experience tones down. You know, we share the traditions often differently than we share the steps because most of us don't have the arrogance to say, I've got step three done. You want to know about step three? I'll give you step three. <laughs> I mean, most of us don't have the huspa to be able to say that. So there, because we have to share it from our own experience and the people in our group watch us live and watch us in the group. So, I mean, you know, it's a vulnerable sort of thing. So when I'm in a balanced place, uh, this is a place of God. It is, it is a privilege to be in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. We reflect society, so we will have problems and issues from time to time. And as a society, because we are a human organization, I think there is a movement towards orthodoxy, which I think gets overdone a little bit, and, and it would be nice if we were, if we noticed that and were careful about it. But human beings have been doing that with every organization since the, the beginning of time, and I suspect we'll continue to do some of that here. Let me add one thing. Um, Bob, thank you. Yeah, I agree with Bob. The the longer I'm in, the more wonderful AA is. And um, it seems to me that there's two things that have us together in this room. And these two things are probably going to be operating forever. And the one is we have in here, if we operate as a we program, we have access to the perfect solution. We have access to this perfect power of love. And by uniting, we can experience it. So we have the absolute joy of the program. But let's not forget the other critical element that holds AA together. It's right out there. And it's called alcohol. Cunning, baffling, powerful. And you combine those two, no matter what frame of mind you're in, well, I'm out of here. You go out there, I'm back. (laughs) (laughs) And that force out there causes us to continually be very reasonable about what's going on in here. That's where the open mind comes from. Oh, you don't like AA? Give it a try now. (laughs) And those two forces are going to be continuing operating. And and I think as as long as that dynamic is going on, we can be messing around in here with all kinds of stuff and the... You know, I mean, I'm sure we could take the traditions and get things screwed up like the Oxford group, but it it seems to be incredibly well packaged right now. One of the things, there are so many things I like about Sandy, but one of the things I find most attractive is all this communication is positive. And one of the things I want to say about spirituality, there are different ways to use it. And when I talked about orthodoxy, about you can use it to make people wrong, I seem always more receptive and more trusting when we talk about spirituality in its positive aspects. I don't think spirituality has negative aspects. It may have negative applications. The ego uses it in a negative application. So when when we use the program or any of the principles in the program to make someone wrong, I think that is so much less powerful and trustworthy than when we use it to examine our own lives and to use it to forward the growth of our lives. Okay. Yes, sir. How did you... Yes and no, I guess. I can't... In words, I can't tell you. He wanted to know who are... I think kind of who is my higher power and, and do we have a similar higher power. I can't describe my higher power. I can experience my higher power. I think I've been restored to a relationship with a higher power that has been within me all my life. As a young child, I had some very nice experiences of it. I lost it. I went out 
the prodigal son story. I came back in AA and I recovered, I recovered it in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's more of an experience. And I, uh, Dr. Paul, when I'm in, <laughs> asked me the question, who is your God one time when I was doing one of these profound workshops and I, I've never quite been the same. I thought he was an ant. <laughs> so what a crappy question to ask a guy, just, you know, to show up by shallowness. And uh, uh, I can't answer that question. But what, from what I see, when we're all, we're all moving in the same direction, I think all things that are so are of God. So I don't care if you're Buddhist, Islamic, Jewish, AA, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, whatever. I think things that are of God, things that are of love, things that are of being are moving in that direction. And the closer and the further down the road they move, the closer they get together. The farther away they are, they have more personality. But they shed the personality and they get into principle along the way. I think I think your observation is... Um happens all the time from what you see it looks like we have the same higher power and the reason for that is that when Bob's higher power is flowing through him out it looks just like my higher power flowing through me out only we could be experiencing from our perspective different higher powers but it is a source of love, and it just has some wrinkles that I see, and he has some that are over here. But it is this, it is the identical energy. So you're seeing it. You're absolutely right. You're going, God, those two guys have the same God. Uh, and, and, and you're right, but you're not right. It, it is as you see it. How do you find higher power? There's, uh, this is it. If you're brand new, let me tell you, there's only one question you need to ask. And, and write it down. What should I do next? And you ask it of your sponsor, your group, or whatever. You don't figure anything out, ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> so when you say, how do you find a higher power? I don't know. I just ask somebody. <laughs> because we're being guided instead of figuring anything out. And so you just you start in the program. What do I do now? You get a home group. What do I do now? This is all finding God. What do I do now? You take an inventory. What do I do now? You go over to my house. What do you do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? Then you learn to do this with your higher power. What do you want me to do now? What do you want me to do now? You, you see, and that's, and that's it. Now, the ego doesn't like that. Hey, wait, we can improve on that. That's for little babies. <laughs> we can get there quicker. We can get this. Oh, <laughs> That's a thought on that. The question is, how do you handle particularly, there are some personalities that are more challenging and difficult to handle. There's a fine line between observation and criticism, Charlie. Uh, I think you just crossed it. I... Uh, Yeah, I, I struggle with that from time to time. And AA is full of enormously strong personalities. Even though we, uh, one of the paradoxes to me in Alcoholics Anonymous is even though it's principle before personality, is groups have been started by enormously strong people and lives have been altered by enormously strong people uh, who have made a huge difference. I find those people to be unique. I find them, in many cases, to be not understandable. I am not, I don't feel that I am of that category. Uh, do I judge them? Yeah, I do. I, I, I wish I didn't. I wish I didn't sometimes have my attention on different places. What I know is, uh, in general, I cannot do all the good uh, that some of those people do. Uh, some of the people that people touch in Alcoholics Anonymous would die under my hand. Uh, I don't understand it all. It, it is just... Uh, and I don't think there's a shortage of people that I irritate. Uh, <laughs> I mean that. I, I sincerely mean that. So I, I, uh, I think it's one of the paradoxes of... of uh... <laughs> I 
think in the uh, tradition or wherever that shows up, it's um, it is saying that we're all just one drink away from oblivion, no matter how far we've come, because we just have the daily reprieve. And so to put our faith in an individual instead of the principles that it, that, that individual is talking about would be a very bad mistake because everybody is fallible. And so you go, I'm staying sober because I know this gal, Alice, and I, I just the fact that she's there, if she wasn't there, I wouldn't be able to stay sober. If, and then she gets drunk and robs a bank and go, <laughs> there goes my program. But if you continue to live by the principles that she was trying to live by, which she just failed one day, I mean, that's all it was. And so I think it's there. But I agree with Bob. Without some of the personalities that we had in AA, we wouldn't be anywhere. I mean, God, you're back to the co-founder, Bill Wilson. I mean, you know, with all his arrogance and all that. I mean, it was just, where would we be? They always said if, if Dr. Bob was the only founder, you know, we'd still be in Akron. And if Bill was the only founder, he would have sold it. <laughs> Yeah, we forget, you know, sometimes we go, um, well, I'd like to ask him to lead the meeting, but he's only got three months. Do you know what people with three months were doing back in the beginning? All right, um, Fitz, you've got three months. I want you to go to Baltimore and start AA. <laughs> but you're not qualified to lead a discussion meeting. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> okay. We're, I think we're at the end of the time. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Um. Uh, I have always stayed active. Uh, the question is, is life ebbs and flows? Does, does my activity in AA, does my participation in AA ebb and flow? Some people find it daunting to stay sober for the rest of their lives. Uh, the biggest gift that I've been given is I've liked AA since I've, the moment I came. That was my gift. I work with a lot of young people who didn't like AA. My, it's, it's been hard for me to practice a program, but it's been easy for me to stay in AA. So I have stayed in AA for good and bad and been a jerk and not so much. You know, I mean, my, my activity and ability to practice the program has been different. I'll tell you one, act, one thing that I find profoundly different today. I said society is different today and we reflect society. One of the attitudes of younger people today in society is, a, is an attitude of entitlement. The two things that are present today in a way that have not been present in the 60s when Sandy and I came in, I don't think, is immediate gratification has become an art form and entitlement. And I think there is an attitude today, a little bit more, I, I've really been stressed by the amount of slips that I that I see, and I've been a little bit closer working in a couple of, of sober houses, helping put a meeting on. And I get a sense sometimes that the people who are uh, not using have a sense they're giving something up. And I think if you went back to the old timers a little bit more, they were being like let out of jail. And there's so there's a little bit of an attitude of entitlement that I'm giving something up to quit. I really relate to your question in that um, when I was new and they were teaching the day at a time, it didn't take me long. I'm at a place the guy's celebrating five years. And I'm talking to him, and I could see he was planning on staying sober forever. And somebody else had 10 years, and I'm just going. They're just staying this day at a time, but they don't want to get drunk tomorrow. They're, they're really trying to stay here forever. So I was, well, what is this day at a time? And I, so my vision, and, and somebody knew when they vision staying sober forever, it's devastating. What? How can I stay in this much pain for 30 years? <laughs> they have a very valid point, and from their point of view, we got to say, you're right. When, from what you're seeing, that would be terrible. 
So we're not going to ask you to stay in that misery for 30 years. What you can't see is how we're going to transform you so that sobriety is joyful. And you're going to have to trust us that that's going to happen. And then the burden is gone. So I, it really is impossible to see how it stinks over for 30 years, feeling like you do. And we have to tell them, you're not going to feel that way very long. We have something that is going to transform you into enjoying sobriety. Oh, well, now I might be able to do it. So we've got to get them out of the vision they presently have. How about if you found in sobriety what you were looking for in the battle, that sort of thing? Thank you for the privilege of being spending Thank this time all. with you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.